So, Berto, what do you know about John Lennon's psychology? Of his psychology? Yeah. Well, I know uh, he had a few parental issues like all of us do. And I know he probably had a few chips on his shoulder from, you know, challenges and struggles when he was a kid. Um, and he certainly brought those two bear as an, as an adult. He also had to have, because, you know, when they became big and famous, he was like in his early 20s. So he's still growing up. And that changed his whole perspective on so many things. And so that must have had uh, a lot of an impact on the way he behaved towards the world, uh, towards the press, towards his bandmates. Um, and then, of course, when he found uh, Yoko, he probably... And when he went to the East, that actually, to the India, that had a huge effect on him too, just like on all of them, really. But um, overall, I think the guy was going through this big, big journey that he's probably just coming out of by the time he got killed. Like, you know, he was probably on the on the way to, to a, a normalized, kind of more mature plane of, of looking at the world and himself, and then he got shot. Yeah, I would say that's all true. So we're going to do a deep dive on John Lennon's psychology. I have a lot of notes, and so this might take a while. So strap in, strap people. Strap on in. I'm going to state right up front what I think his, what I'm going to conceptualize his personality, and then I'm going to justify it as we go. Okay. Now, of course, I can't diagnose him because I don't know him. I've never assessed him. So in line with my policy about not diagnosing from afar, not you know breaking the gold water rule, I'm not going to diagnose him, but... I will say that from what I can tell and what from a lot of people can tell, what we can gather from resources, and there are many because he, he was pretty honest in, in interviews. Yeah. And obviously, you know, there's been a lot of time for the truth to come out from family members and stuff. I think that he presents a good example of someone with borderline personality. Mm. I'm not going to say he suffered from the disorder. and I will say, though, that he was, he was on the spectrum. And I think his... He provides a good case study of that. I, yeah, that I can't. Sounds... I can't say for sure because I would never. I haven't known him or assessed him, but um, but we can go over what we can glean from the evidence to point in that direction. Do you know? Do you know? I totally. Not only do I agree with that, but there are things he did that remind me of people in my life that probably have a similar situation going all right on in there. well when we we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna go through his life from zero yep. to 40 step by step yep. and when it comes up let us know this is the psychology in seattle podcast i'm your host dr kirk honda i'm a therapist a professor and a avid avid lover of the beatles and john lennon who are you Bruno? my name is umberto castaneda and i teach how to set up humidifiers so you and i are super fans of the beatles definitely but I feel like we need to provide evidence to the internet to, to prove our credentials. What, what are some of your credentials, Bruno? Well, I mean, on the one hand, uh, I, am, I have been so obsessed with, over the years, with their recording methods and all the stories of their recordings. So I have probably 10 different books related to how they recorded each song, what instruments they used, how they, what, how they mic'd it, as well as the thinking, what the lyrics meant, what all these kind of things. And I've been reading those since uh, 1993. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. So for me, similar, I, I never went down that road because I just, I don't know why. I, I just never thought about gear in that way. I think you're more of a, especially in the past, you were yeah. more of a gear person. Definitely gearhead, yeah. Um, for me, I, they're my favorite band. I think they are the best band that ever lived or ever will live for all time forever. I don't yeah. think you could ever have a better band than the Beatles. More influential, more culturally influential, more charming. I mean, late at night, I'll just watch YouTube videos <laughs> of them just hanging out on a, on a bus. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's just, they're, they're just so goddamn charming. Yeah. Um, they released records from late 1962 to 1969. That's like seven or eight years. Yep. And that they were and still are the best-selling band in history. And it's it's crazy. Like when you when you look at the schedule of their releases, they were together <laughs> for less amount of time than we've been doing this podcast. Yes, and and yet 
And yet, you know, like album after album with like these powerhouse hits and yeah. like crazy and not just hits, like changing what music was like. Right. Groundbreaking, experimental. Everyone copied them and still do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Best selling band in history. They have sold. Uh, guess how many units worldwide <laughs> they sold of all time. Of their CDs. Oh, everything. Records, Here's tapes, records. everything. Uh, okay. So, you know, 50 million. One billion. <laughs> a billion units. More than a billion <laughs> units. Oh, my God. That's insane. You know, because when you, when you sell, what, like half a million, that's a gold record? Yeah. So, Platinum's a million. <laughs> right. So, so they have a thousand platinum records. <laughs> they have 2,000 gold records. That's crazy. Um, they have the most number one albums of all time, most number one hits of all time. Um, in high school... Every inch of my bedroom wall was covered with Beatles stuff. <laughs> I had posters. I had uh, records. I crazy. had postcards. I had stickers. I had memorabilia. Yeah. I had my, there wasn't anything and no one else was on the wall. There, there weren't any other bands. Wow. It was just the Beatles, just a, a shrine to the Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> um, I could go on and on, but just another couple of data bullet points here. My favorite song of all time is Yesterday. When Paul sings it, and I've seen him live sing it more than once, I always cry. Even when I see tribute bands like Rain yeah. or the other tribute uh, Beatles bands, whenever they always play Yesterday, and I always cry during that. It, it's a song that came out of nowhere yeah. and just so perfect. <laughs> and when I was in London, I made a beeline for the home that he wrote this song in. It was uh. at... Uh, Asher, her her home. Um, we, you and I have performed a Beatles album from beginning to end yep. live. We, yep. you and I, learned the harmonies and every song, Rubber Soul, yep. from beginning to end. That takes dedication. Yeah. Uh, whenever someone asks me what famous person I would like to hang out with, I always say Paul McCartney, of course, or, or, or John Lennon. <laughs> but it's usually it's usually Paul McCartney, but it's often John Lennon as well. I, I should point out so. For me, because you, you had Beatles in your life probably from the moment you were born, because probably your brothers had, your your parents had, That's right? right? Yeah. My my brother had uh, 45s okay. with like Yellow Submarine yeah. and that uh, kind of stuff. So I, my journey was a little different because uh, my dad was not into the Beatles. And so the only quote unquote Beatles stuff I knew coming up was whatever they would play on the radio still, you know. In Colombia? In Colombia. Until I remember distinctly one day I went to visit... Uh, an older participant in my Taekwondo class. And I was probably 11 at the time and he was 17 or 18. And me and my dad went over because he was like my dad's... There was some familiar relation. And we went over and the guy had every Beatles record and all these posters. Probably like your room. Like it could have been you. And I just like, whoa. And then he starts playing songs. And I'm like, oh, I know that one. I've never heard this one. And it's just like this magical world opened up to me. And then my cousin, Diego, who was this amazing keyboardist, he started teaching me Let It Be on the piano and on the, on the organ. And then that was it for me. And then he also had the, you know, the blue and the red. Yeah. Uh, those. So I, I would listen to those. And we took this trip, this car, uh, car trip that was an eight-hour road trip. And we had a tape in the car, listening to it the whole way over and over and over. Yeah. It's all Beatles songs. Yeah. So that's when I really started deep diving. Yeah, for, for me, yeah, I grew up with the Beatles always on the radio. And my family would have records, yeah. I remember. And my friends would have records. And loved the Beatles a lot. But I didn't really, you know, when you're a kid, you're not like a, an avid fan of anything right. usually. But when I became like, I don't know, like 12 years old, I got the cassette that read, I think I got it from Safeway. The I was in the one. line and I was like, oh, I want that Beatles album. And it's the, their best of songs from their early years. Yeah. And I brought that home and I listened to that <laughs> album over and over and over again. And I would sit on my bed with my wooden uh, tennis racket and I would pretend that I was you know, in the yeah. Beatles and I'd, I'd sing along. You probably had the same effect where even to this day, a lot of times when a song plays that's in one of those tapes, you still imagine the one that comes next no, in that tape. <laughs> I don't actually because oh, don't? pretty okay. quickly after that, I 
started acquiring all the albums. Ah. And so uh, to me, and so, well, the problem with me actually is that the next song is often the American version of the albums, mm. you know what I mean? Which isn't the real, al- like some songs I associate with certain albums that actually aren't on that album. Sure. If you're a Beatles fan, you understand what I'm saying. Anyway, so um, let's get into John Lennon's life. Born October 9, 1940 in Liverpool, England. Born, uh, so his, his family said, and I think particularly his mom, Julia, said that he was born during a German air raid uh, from World War II. That's stressful. Right. But when they actually look at the historical record, that's not possible. Oh, okay. So right away, you see that his mom and his family mm. have kind of an issue with the truth. Sure. Kind of an issue with narcissism or making things a little bit... things. Yeah. Uh, he was named John Winston after Winston Churchill. Wow. I didn't know that. Which makes sense because at the time, 1940, Winston Churchill yeah. was the savior of... He's the man. ...of... Uh, of Britain. His father, what do you know about his father? Do you know anything about him? No. Yeah, I didn't. So after, before doing this deep dive, I didn't know anything about his dad. Of course, I knew about Julia. I mean, the, the other thing is like, I read probably like, I don't know, three or four big biographies, but this was in 93 and 94. So I probably forgot almost everything. Right. <laughs> So the, his father's name was Alf, and he looks exactly like John Lennon. And his father, so let's get into his father's life. So his father's father, Mm -hmm. so his father's name is Alf. So Alf's father died when Alf was very young. Mm. So Alf spent many years in an orphanage. I don't know where his mom was, but but Alf spent many years in an orphanage, which is a massive attachment injury. Yeah. So if you are raised in in such an environment, you tend to later in life have a hard time attaching to other people. Yeah. And have a hard time being there for your children. Right. So yeah, it's a similar problem in the African American Which can community. then perpetuate itself. Right? right. It's a similar problem in the African American community. When in during the slave times and after, you know, depending on certain social uh, constructs and institutions that were happening, was that you would physically separate children from the parents, you know, as as slaves. And so those kids grow up with right. a massive attachment injury. Yep. Then when slavery was made illegal, you now have all these people with massive attachment injuries yep. and they start having kids and they have a harder time connecting to their kids yep. because when they were three, they were you know, basically just thrown around to different people. And you, you just rinse and repeat that over the years and you... Uh, are have a live in a racist society and blah 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 right and stress also can lead to people having a harder time with their parenting and you get situations today where in the african-american group of people there's a much higher rate of parents not sticking around for their kids yeah and and so uh, well and then it's been exacerbated since the 70s and 80s with the mass incarceration right of of black males <laughs> right exactly yeah and he's right. So if your dad was falsely imprisoned or unfairly imprisoned, you grow up feeling like, well, dads don't stick around. I'm not worth sticking around for. Right. I have to become kind of walled off from my, from my attachment needs. Yeah. Then when I grow up and I have kids, it's harder to connect because you're just like, you just don't have that, the neurons literally right. to connect with other human beings in that way. Of course, there are many black people who aren't this way, but I, it, it is a phenomenon of attachment that I think is quite obvious to me. And with Alf, his dad, so John Lennon's grandfather died when Alf was young. And so this, this made Alf having some issues with attachment. Alf sang and played the banjo. And he specialized in, he was sort of like a semi-professional, oh, Alf, wow. John Lennon's father. He specialized in impersonating Lou, Louis Armstrong and Al Jolson. What? Which sort of creeps me out because it, it rings of blackface. Because this would have yeah. been like in the 20s when he would have yeah, done this sure. or the Could 30s. <laughs> um, Alf ran away from the orphanage as a child to join a traveling music show. And he was caught and severely punished. What? Alf's personality was happy-go-lucky, couldn't resist having a good time. He was sort of a class clown. He never held a job for very long, and he borrowed money from other people. He eventually became a merchant seaman, 
I think because it it sort of lent itself to his lifestyle of yeah. not uh, having sort of a steady job, and he was gone most of the time. And World War II required a lot of merchant seamen to be working a lot because yeah. there was a lot of jobs to be doing. Um, and he actually tried to get a job in Liverpool as a singer and entertainer, but he didn't get the job, so he ended up uh, leaving John and Julia. Uh, so that was massive abandonment for John. So John was very open about the fact that he was very hurt and angry at his father for never being there. Yeah. What do you know about his mother? Julia. I mean, he loved his mom, um, but uh, it sounds like she was a little chaotic or something, like uh, maybe not dependable in a sense. Uh, have you seen Nowhere Boy? No. You got to see it. Is that about... You have um, a problem with watching Beatles movies. That, that's how I'm a better fan than you are. <laughs> like you haven't seen Across no. the Universe. You're, you're, you're getting it backwards. I'm such a fan that no one will get it right. <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't seen Two of Us. You haven't seen Nowhere Boy. But Across the Universe have you isn't seen Backbeat? about the Beatles, have right? Have you seen Backbeat? Of course. Backbeat's the one movie I watched. <laughs> but wait, Across the Universe is not... It's a musical. It's, yeah. But, and it's not about the Beatles, but, yeah. it, but it's mus- it has music from yeah. the Beatles. But uh, Nowhere Boy is about John when he's in his teen years, and Julia is a big part of that movie. And, and I think that given the source material, they did pretty yeah. well with it. But yeah, so Julia, Julia Stanley, her personality was that she really liked to party, which was similar to Alf. So uh, John Lennon's uh, parents uh, both liked to drink a lot and go out a lot and were pr- both promiscuous. And she didn't like being proper. And she loved black music from America. She, she loved Elvis. That makes sense. And again, quite what they quote unquote promiscuous, meaning that she liked to party and meet, sure. meet men and have sex and drink and everything like that. Promiscuous at the time. <laughs> yeah. Like well, probably like the, the reason why I say quote unquote <laughs> promiscuous is because promiscu- promiscuous is a judgmental term. Yeah. And it's like, why do we have to judge people who like to have sex with randos? Yeah. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Anyway. John's early childhood, what do you know about it? So, you know, before he's four years old. Um, so, oh, before he's four? Yeah. Oh, I don't think I know or remember much. So, father gone most of the time, which, yeah. which we already said. But, so looking into his life, I, I learned so much in this deep dive. I, it's like <laughs> so interesting. Because I've watched so many documentaries. Yeah. Ron Howard make a, made a documentary a couple years ago that you actually gave me the vinyl for. Yeah, but I've, I've rarely seen movies or documentaries where it's about their childhood. Well, and I think it's because the main documentaries, like the anthology one, sure. um, was there, was that what it was called, anthology? It was like 10, it was like 10 VHS tapes. Right, yeah, I have that. <laughs> um, they are produced by the Beatles themselves. Yeah. So they don't want the nasty side to come out, right? Right. And so... Well, but I mean, you know, but I remember a few stories like, you know, him in in his prep school and things like that. But a lot of it is like as he's getting a little older and then... Well, we're going to get into stuff where I'm guessing you don't know and you're going to be like, what? Yeah. And and it's like, it's all right there. It's all reported on. John Lennon even talked about it. And it's like, how come as a massive Beatle fan... (laughs) This has never been emphasized to me, right. or maybe I was in denial of it because I want to be a fan. Yeah. There's a lot of darkness to the story, is my point, for, to the John Lennon story. Um, so father was gone most of the time when he was an infant and a you know, preschool age person. He often saw his mom, Julia, coming home drunk with a new lover. Yeah. So that's something that they don't portray. Yeah. You know, they're like, Julia was a free spirit. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll say in the documentary. Sure. They won't say she was potentially an alcoholic. <laughs> who would have sex with random men and bring all these men into their home. Right. Okay? Um, this is while she's married, by the way. To, oh, to, right. To, he's just not around. He's just not around. Yeah. In the night, John would wake up in the middle of the night and be alone and would be terrified. So imagine you're two years old. Oh. You wake up in the middle of the night. You're all alone. And he would scream and scream and scream. Oh. And the neighbors would hear him and come over. Oh, where, and she was gone. Yeah. He, she would leave him alone? Yeah. What the... What? See, that's not talked about. Never. She would just leave him alone at two. Yeah. 
Oh my god. Yeah. So this is the this is the beginning of borderline. So when you're abandoned and when you're mistreated in this way, this oh is the god. this is the building blocks of a scenario where as a child you have to develop Jeez. a style of coping with that. Yeah. And one of the styles of coping is the borderline style, which is to be extremely sensitive to anything approaching abandonment to make sure that people stay with you. Wow. Uh, Julia got pregnant with another man during this time, and her parents forced her into a maternity home and, and forced her to put up the child for adoption. During this time, John was given to her father's brother while Julia was in the maternity home. And so this is an, another massive attachment injury. So when he's young, he's basically completely separated from his dad and his mom. His, his dad, he probably never had an attachment to, but his mom, arguably, he did. And, you know, while the mom was in the maternity home, he, John had to go to, to his uncle. Wow. So imagine that. Yeah. Imagine you're two, three years old, and you don't know where your dad is, you don't know where your mom is, and yeah. you're living with a random uncle. Yeah, I mean, I, the, I can relate to some of this because, you know, I didn't know where my mom was and I had to live, not with a random uncle, I had to live with my grandparents and my aunt for a year at three with my dad in, in Massachusetts and New York. Oh, Massachusetts. so this happened to you. I, some of it did. I mean, not, right, so not me being left alone all night. So to demonstrate the, the coping style that I was saying earlier, you did not develop a borderline uh, personality style. You were faced with a very similar situation as John Lennon. What you developed was a narcissistic style. Yeah. <laughs> One in which you would say, well, I guess I don't really need people that much. Right. I'll, I'll just sort of, ah, I'm okay on my own. Right. I'm very self-efficient. I can handle things on my own. Right, right, right. You also developed a sense of a grandiose self of like, I'm special. I'm the best. You know, I am. And, and, and look and, at look at me. Right. You know? And everyone would tell me that. Right. Because they, you know. Well, there's a system, right? So that and that might have pushed you over the edge into right. narcissism, and that that you know gave you the direction to go in because right. it was it made you feel good to sort of play into that. But then as you play into that, you become more of a showman. Yeah. And your family starts to reward you for that. Right, right, right. And you start getting love and attention from <laughs> that. Maybe even your mom starts paying a little bit more attention to you because of that. I don't know. And so then you develop a narcissistic style. Right. Um and uh but John didn't. And John actually did so I should say we'll eventually get to this. He developed a narcissistic style as well, but he was more borderline, but right. it was bored. And I consider borderline and narcissism to be basically on a spectrum. Mm. Okay. S at some point, his father learned about his wife's lifestyle and the way he was raising his, his kid. Right. You know, he comes back from right, the ship right, right. and he's like, what's what going on? <laughs> and he kidnaps John. Oh my God. What? Yeah. He kidnaps John? I mean, John? basically, I mean, yeah. it's his, he it's takes his son him. He takes him. Yeah. and he, if I remember right, he was going to bring John to New Zealand with him. Yeah, you know what? It's funny as you're saying these things. The little bits I sort of remember from like reading the biography or whatever are things like, and then John spent some time with his dad. Right. You know, it was like kind of statements like that. <laughs> right. But for clinicians out there, they will know this story, or people who've been through stories like this, like whenever you have that kind of highly contentious couple yeah. with a kid and a quote unquote promiscuous mom who's drinking all the time, this is a very, very common story right. where there's custody battles and quote unquote kidnappings and stuff. Yeah. Um, Julia eventually found them and there was a fight and the parents forced John to choose between the parents. Oh my God. <laughs> this is at the age of like three or four years old. Oh my God. And because, and as very typical, because John missed his dad so much, and saw his dad as like a Disneyland dad, chose his dad. Okay. And, uh, and he felt it incredibly guilty that, you know, yeah. he had to reject his mom to her face. Guilty at three. Yeah. <laughs> but in the end, his mom got custody of him, and the, okay. and the dad basically disappeared. And the dad disappeared. To John, he disappeared because he didn't care. And, of course, Julia would uh, reinforce that notion. Sure. But to the dad, he was like, I tried, but your mom was so 
overpowering and yeah. so conflictual that I just decided it was right. best if I just didn't come around anymore. And oh, of man. course, the dad also had attachment issues and blah, blah, blah. So at the age of four, the parents officially separated and divorced, and he went to go live with Aunt Mimi and Uncle George. Why he didn't still live with Julia, I don't know. Yeah. But I think it's Julia was, was not really interested in being a mom. That's crazy. Aunt Mimi and Uncle George didn't have any children, so that kind of worked out for John. Yeah. And again, massive abandonment, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we've already multiple attachment <laughs> injuries, uh, and he's not even five years old yet. That's so insane. Uh, his relationship with Aunt Mimi, or Mimi, I, I don't know how you pronounce it, and George was supposedly good. Again, he's Mimi. Uh, he's, a, he's an only child, so he got lots of attention. Reportedly, he had a good relationship with his Uncle George, and from what I can tell, it was a good, good enough relationship with Aunt Mimi. Julia remarried. Did you know this? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. But, but I, w- I will comment on one thing. It's like, I think, because this is where a lot of the stories pick up. Right. It's like, John, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then his parents, have, and then he was living with uncle and auntie. And Right. They don't talk about. Right. Because I think even if people know about this, they're like, well, John was young. What does it matter? Yeah. But it's like his personality was 90% formed by the time, yeah. Julie, you know, he went to go live with Aunt yeah, Mary, yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, Julia remarried, started a new family. She had two more kids, and she didn't take John back. So imagine that. Oh, my God. Imagine that. Your mom, <laughs> who's still alive, right. living just like a couple miles down the street, uh, is now married and having kids, and you can't go see your mom. Yeah. Um, imagine the abandonment. Oh, my God. Um, and is, she, and is, is Mimi, Mimi her sister? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, John's early personality is reportedly very much like his dad, a prankster, a jokester, but he was also a bully. Did you know this? He was a bully. Yeah. That, so that's some of the stuff I remember from like in his, uh, prep, prep school years or whatever, like how he, he was kind of a dick. (laughs) Right. So in the, uh, romanticized version of this, it's, it's like, well, you know, John, he was always caustic. Yeah. You know, he was always like above it all. But no, he was a dick. Yeah. He was a jerk bully yeah. who would harm and abuse other kids. Yeah. And totally uncool. I, I remember him, I do remember him like saying something about that in some interview, like just how horrible he was when I was a kid or something like that. Yeah. He drew funny pictures of people. He would make fun of teachers. He was disruptive in class. Um, and again, I've seen a lot of clients like this, yeah. just sort of a classic scenario, massive attachment injuries, lots of sorrow, lots of trauma. And guess what? In school, they're struggling. They're having a hard time with relationships. They're, they're be, they, they're bullying other people. They might be being bullied as well. They're getting in fights and stuff. Disruptive. Right. Um, a teacher thought that he was going to totally fail at school. So they're like, well, he likes to draw. So maybe he should go to art school. Yeah. Um, age 14, 15, his uncle George dies. So this is a, a big loss. Basically his dad, yeah. his only dad figure dies right. when he's a teenager. That That's a big loss. Age 16. And so now we're getting into the Nowhere Boy movie. It's on Netflix, actually. You can watch it, Birdo. Um, <laughs> what do you know about his teenage years? Well, I do know he was very much into art. I I, I have a feeling like... He mostly wanted to be an artist and he, uh, but you know, he was really into music as well. Uh, he, yeah, he was a total troublemaker. Um, and if I remember right, like he didn't really want to stay in school. Like he just wanted to kind of do his own thing. Yeah. Uh, he also, he started hanging out more with his mother at his mother's house. Cause I think he was more mobile as an, as a older teen. And, they had a very companionate dynamic. She was more like a friend uh, or a girlfriend. Did, didn't in some his ways. mom buy him a guitar or something? Yeah. So, yeah. It, so his aunt Mimi was n- not supportive of John's musician, right, right, right. which you know makes sense. It's like, uh, hey, kid, the chance of you making money right. is pretty slim. It's time that you get more serious about your studies. Yeah. What do you think? You're gonna be the Beatles? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's so weird that she like predicted that, you know, yeah. um, 
but the mom, Julia, was really into Elvis and they would listen to Elvis songs and other music, you know, uh, from America and they would dance around and they would learn how to play music on the banjo and she bought him his first guitar. So, so to him, going to his mom's house was like this fun, fun yeah, playing music and stuff. Yeah. And this is perhaps where his personality starts to gel with his drive to make music. So, again, imagine you're growing up. Mm. All you want is your love from your mother. Right. And it's constantly just over the horizon. And you're being rejected and you're hurt and you're in pain like over and over and over again. And then all of a sudden, she, you come into her life, you get a little bit more connection with her. And she's really into music because so, you know, Alf, his father also played music right? and she drank and would go out and listen to music and, and listen to jukeboxes and stuff. And so John's looking at his mom and mom's into music. Well, if I play music, mom, right. mom and, and the more, and as I get interested in music, mom really gets, you know, excited about that. Yeah. And so this infuses music with getting the love mm. and it, love it this is where the 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 obsession comes in yeah obsession and a little bit of narcissism comes in just like if i become a performer i get i get a little bit more love and attachment um that that i've always wanted that's interesting um he started a band the quarryman quarryman, named after his school and and again mimi didn't like it julia loved it Uh, julia would go to the shows and would clap and whistle louder than anyone else so again, just further solidifying John's drive. Right. Uh, he met Paul and, and later George. It's funny because you see those pictures of him when he's that age, and he he looks so different. He, he you know because he didn't. I don't think he wore glasses. He has like this little kind of peach fuss kind of face. Yeah. And if if you see him in action, you could probably tell quickly. Oh, he's a rabble rouser. But if you see him in the static photos, he looks kind of a little. Like a nice young kid, you know, like a, a nice little a- angel. <laughs> yeah. Age 17, Julia died. Do you know the circumstances around her dying? No, I don't remember. A drunk off-duty police officer ran her o- or hit her with his car. And while she was walking? Yeah, you know, she was walking across Holy the street. Holy crap. A friend of hers was nearby and was walking the other way and heard a loud thud and turned around to see Julia's body flying through the air. Oh, my God. Julia, Julia landed 100 feet from where she had been hit. Well, this is like slammed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, shit. Like thrown through the air yeah, 100, 100 feet. feet. So the, I, I mentioned the details of her death because John would have known this. Yeah. John would have known it was a police officer who was drunk. Right. He would have known that she violently threw, th- flew through, sh- through the air and died. You know oh. what I mean? And so... Not only is this obviously a, a trauma to him in terms of the violence and the and the suddenness of it. Yeah. While he he was just starting to develop, you know, the relationship he always wanted to with his mom, but it also is a form of abandonment to have right. your, to have your mom die. It you oh know. Oh my it's, god! It's and like, he had had his his dad essentially die. His right. real dad left. His quote unquote dad dies. Then his mom dies as he's developing this. Right. Relationship. And he's killed her and she's killed by an off-duty cop. How old was she, was he? 17. 17. S- 16, 17. Oh. And so he is ext- you know and doesn't really have a way of coping with this. By the way, the cop was acquitted of all charges. Uh you know, I, I guess oh you my know, god. This problem extends into uh UK. And he was just given a short suspension from duty. He later left the police force and became a postman. So John could not bring himself to look at his mother's corpse when he was taken uh, to the hospital. He was so distraught during the funeral that he put his head in his aunt's lap throughout the service. Oh, my God. Uh, this is extremely traumatizing to him, ex- uh, just grief-stricken. Um, one of the worst things... So I you know, treat a lot of people with personality disorders, and often, not often, but sometimes they will have a parent that will die while I'm treating them. And it will be a parent who mistreated them when they were growing up. Mm. And I have witnessed that that loss is much harder to cope with than if you actually had a good relationship with your parents, wow. which seems ironic, right? Because it seems yeah. like, well, if you hated your mom because she was a terrible mother to you, 
and she dies, you'd be like, well, good riddance. You know, yeah. she never she never loved me anyway. But it's actually the opposite because the person never got what they deserved or wanted or needed from that parent. Yeah, and, and with, now it's permanently done. Now it's permanent. And so Ugh. now it's really gone. Brutal. Like you're really never going to get what you want. And it makes it much, much worse. So, uh, so John went through that horribleness. And guess how he coped? He went to therapy and he talked about his feelings. No, no. Guess, guess, or people reached out to him and <laughs> he became an even bigger, <laughs> like, kind of. Right. He started getting, he was extremely violent. Yeah. And he drank a lot. Oh, of course. Medicate, self medicate, and lash out at the world. And he got closer to Paul McCartney, who also lost his mother. Um, oh, of course. That would have been a total bonding point. Yeah. So let's get into the Paul John dynamic, but let's take a break first. What do you say, bro? Let's do it. All right. We're back from the break. If you haven't become a patron of the podcast, do so now. Um, sing a, a Beatles song about becoming a patron of the podcast. If you want to support us, do us all a favor by becoming a patron. You can become a patron too. Patronize us today. Hooray. Na 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 na. Hooray. Um, <laughs> um, Great. So become a patron of the podcast. When you do, you get access to a lot of secret, awesome stuff. Arguably, our best episodes are only available to patrons. And it's a way for us to know that you appreciate what we're doing. And it gives us, you're the wing beneath, beneath our, you're the wind beneath our wings. <laughs> Did I say you're the wing beneath? You're the wing that's on top of our wind making us fall. <laughs> I love my parents to death, but I have acquired <laughs> their... Uh, twisted tongue and their <laughs> inability to say idioms um they they both have a hard time with idioms. better to have a rock in hand than a bushel in the foot <laughs> yeah exactly um okay so the paul john dynamic what can you say about that uh okay so i think john was probably you know again chip on his shoulder and always sort of combative probably really high opinion of himself and very very like judgmental of others, very high standards. So imagine when this kid, you know, he's like, oh, I hear, you know, this Paul McCartney or this kid Paul, right? And he's like, well, can you play? But for the first time probably ever, he runs into someone who can like basically better than him and who can, who, who knows so much about music in that context that he's like, okay, I guess I got to give you some sort of respect. Yeah. And then they start talking and yeah, they have things in common. They like the same kind of music. They're the same age, basically. Well, actually, actually that, that's, that's, that's actually not true. I mean, to us looking back, they're similar age, but they're about 20 months apart. Oh, that's a big deal. Then. Right. When yeah. you're 17 yeah, that's a good point. and you're, you're hanging out with a 15, all, barely yeah. a 16 year old. John, so, John definitely is the older one. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And so, Paul, it, it was, so actually now I can think of that dynamic even more interesting because John is probably like, I can take this kid under my wing, but at the same time, I respect the hell out of him. Right, exactly. Yeah. I, I'm in charge because yeah. I'm the older kid. Right. And he's a talent. And yeah. so it kind of balances out. John just, can still feel yeah. superior, but he also really wants what Paul has to offer. That's really good to point out because I always pictured in my head, I always pictured John and Paul sort of the same age. Then there's the little George and there's the older Ringo. Ringo, I think, is the same age as John. He's a little older, but... Maybe just by a couple of months. I think he's born the same year that John he? was born. I thought yeah, he was like 19, a year older. 1940, okay. yeah. Well, I always had it like backwards. And, George well, was backwards, but. three years younger, yeah. three or four years younger than, than John. But anyway... Um, so, when you look up on the internet, the relationship be between Paul and John, what do you think that they talk about? On the internet? Yeah. Oh, you know, the, they, they probably say like, hey, you know, they, they co-wrote some of the greatest songs ever, but then they fought a lot afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. The internet is obsessed with their so-called feud. Yeah. It's like, and to people, I find that to be extremely surprising to me because to me i know the real story yeah which is that from the day they met 
until the Beatles broke up, they were best, best friends. Yeah. And at the end of the Beatles, there was some bickering, but they were still friends. They, they were went st- through a period of, yeah. of a serious period of conflict. But. Well, <laughs> it, you know, what kind of conflict, you know? It, it wasn't like the way that people think it was, you know? They, you, you've been in bands, I've been in bands with you, I've yeah. been in bands. There are times when there's tension. Yeah, I know, but it wasn't like you and me. There was... Not like you and me, but like, not as bad as I think the way that they portray it to be. It was, Okay, fair enough. It was like me and, and, and our other, one of our ex-bandmates. Okay, but even then... During that time, we were all still yeah, friends. Yeah, we were all still hanging out, and then I'm still friends. And but, there were times when there were issues and yeah. and complaints and stuff. I just like I saw a recent interview with Paul. Uh, was it Howard Stern? I don't know what, what he was on, and but he was talking about Howard Stern was like pushing on him about like you know when they were trading songs back and forth, right, and hitting each other pretty hard, especially John and. Uh, but Paul made a point to say, like, yeah, I mean, we were, we were definitely, not, I paraphrase him, not in a happy place between us at that moment. But, but you know, we reconnected and we, and right. we, we, we patched it up. And, and I was so grateful that we did because then he got killed and it would have been terrible, horrible if, if we hadn't, you know. And it was only probably a couple years yeah. where they were so-called feuding yeah. through the press and through these songs, which I'll get into later. But very quickly, they started hanging out again. And even while they were writing those songs, it wasn't like they hated each other with a yeah, passion. Right. It was more like they were just kind of taking some pot shots at each other. Right. And, you well, know, I mean, I they're, have, they're 27 at the yeah, time or something. I, or no, as, they, no, they would have been 30-ish. But, yeah. but as you know, I have experience with people that I consider friends, that consider me friends, and and that have had the equivalent of those kinds of vitriolic songs, right? Not in a song form, but like in an email form, for example. Yeah. And, you know, even then, even when I got those emails, I never thought this is the end of our relationship. Right. You, you just you yeah. say, well, you, think about it, all you people out there who have been in long-term relationships. Have there been times when you have wanted to have your spouse get run over by a bus right. or, you know, you're so angry, right. you're so upset, you're so pissed off at that person right. that you, you'll, you'll even say horrible things. <laughs> and then you make up and you're like, I'm sorry, I said those things. That's what John and Paul were like. And to your point, the rest of the time, we're talking about them living together. Yeah. Living together. Think about living with a bandmate. Right. The whole time for they, years and years. They did everything together. Yeah. They went to India together. Yeah. They did movies together. In the early years, they talk about this in the documentaries, how the van that they would use to tour yeah. Britain with and maybe Germany was so cold because they didn't have any heat that the four of them would lay on top yeah. of it. On Beetle, top. What do they call it? The Beatles sandwich or the Beatles? Yeah. <laughs> and because that kept them warm. Yeah. So imagine you got four, you know, 21-year-old kids <laughs> piled in a van huddling together for warmth yeah. and how good of a friend you would have to be. So... So that's, I, I just find it, you know, like when you talk about Oasis. It's like, Paul, why are you putting your finger there? That's not my finger, John. <laughs> yeah. Those aren't pillows. Um, to you planes, trains, and automobiles fans out there. So the, um, uh, the other thing, the other movie is the Two of Us movie that talks about them uh, in the 70s-ish time, uh, which portrays their relationship. You know, they would visit and blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Right. So, yeah. Now, about how they came together in the beginning, I agree with you, Berto. They were a good match. Paul, I think, given his mom dying when he was quite young, Paul acquired the narcissistic version, but he was raised well enough by his dad. You know, his dad didn't have the problems that Julia had. Paul McCartney had good enough attachment so that he didn't have to resort to a coping style that was too drastic, but he did adopt some narcissism. Yeah. As anyone who knows Paul McCartney, you know, he comes across. Um, Now, his problems weren't as bad as John Lennon's. No, he seems a lot more centered. Yeah. Even even when they were young. (laughs) Right. 
his relationship with Linda wasn't yeah. tumultuous. He didn't, and we'll get into the problems that John got into in life that are really quite common for people with borderline. <clears throat> but anyway, so John is, uh, they're both teenagers. Paul is more than narcissistic. And so he's more aloof, right. but stable. And John is more unstable and um, needy. And yeah. so they kind of fit together in, in that way. Um, okay. So college years, they keep playing music and they met Stuart Sutcliffe. Mm-hmm. And what do you know about him? Stu was the artist, the true artiste. Um, I mean, they they all sort of looked up to Stu's artis- artistry, and he was very good looking, apparently. <laughs> I mean, I've seen the pictures. He was a good looking guy. Um, yeah, he looked like James Dean. Yeah, wore his sunglasses a lot. Uh, he They wanted him to be in the band, but he didn't really want to be in the band. And so, like, he would play bass, but he didn't really play bass very well. And... Um, and mostly he, he, he wanted to be an artist. And John, John really kind of looked up to that, you know. He right. really respected that. Right. So Stuart Sutcliffe was more on the level of John. You know, yeah. Paul was younger and George is younger. And so Stuart came on the scene and was much more of an intellectual equal yeah. to, to John Lennon. You know, he was sort of tougher than, than Paul was. And, yep. and so John really took to him and they became best friends and John was, as you say, enamored with him. Stuart Sutcliffe was super cool. And he they, was the rock star. <laughs> yeah. And the, 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 there's evidence that John and Stuart might have had a sexual relationship as well. And in this way, we see that uh, John starts to switch from Paul to Stuart in terms of atta- his, his attachment. Yeah. So, a theme for borderline people is that they will be, once they latch on to someone and, and they, perceive that a relationship is has the potential to be strong they will forego all their other relationships uh-huh. because they're so worried about this one relationship not going well so they pour all of their energy into one relationship because if they're worried if they diffuse their energies no one will stick around so Stu was the original yoko <laughs> well paul was i think like sort of. Well, Julia was the original. Yeah. And then, and I'm guessing he also had some best friends in 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 his youth that, uh, prior to Stuart that are less famous that sure. he did this to as well. But yeah, so Stuart Sutcliffe definitely. I see. So what you're saying is John, as a pattern, when he had a new kind of okay, this is my new attachment. Right. He'd be like, everyone else, be gone. <laughs> right. And that one person becomes all good. Right. They become perfect. They become like the answer right. to his dreams. So Paul at first was perfect. Probably, yeah. And then they fought for the rest of their yeah. relationship. Uh, this is the time of the Backbeat movie that came out in 1994, that uh, Astrid, uh, and they're, they're developing their sound in Hamburg and all that kind of stuff and their look. Yep. Age 20, Pete Best joined the band. They start playing at the Liverpool's Cavern Club. Also a good-looking individual. Right. You know, he also had the look. Yeah. Uh, and also wasn't very great musician. In fact, he him, him and Stu were so like better looking because you know Paul had a a nice you know uh, a pretty face, but it was kind of a like a normal pretty face, right? right. But these guys looked kind of like the part, right? So they actually didn't fit, <laughs> like they didn't look like Beatles. <laughs> yeah, they started getting a following at this point, a local following in Liverpool. 1961, age 20, 21, discovered by Brian Epstein at Liverpool's Cavern Club. They had an interesting relationship, John and Brian. What do you know about it? So actually, uh, I I got a graphic novel about Brian Epstein, which is really great. Can can you... Do you still have these things? Yeah. Can you bring them over sometime? Oh, absolutely. Can you bring over the Sandman ones? Yeah, yeah. Because like, I want to see if I would enjoy these things. Sure. I will bring a, a little uh, care package for you next time. Okay. But so this one, uh, I, I, it was actually a recent uh, book they released. Um, it's it's just the sort of the life of Brian Epstein, and it's really done artistically really well. Um, and it it doesn't just consider when he came into the Beatles' life; it starts before that, but obviously it ends while he was with the Beatles. Right. Um, I know that Brian. Brian was a very, very smart, obviously a very astute 
individual because he didn't, he didn't just like oh these guys have a following here like he saw way beyond like he was truly a visionary in that sense like he was like you know i i see really really big things for you um he had a very they loved him like they, they had a really strong relationship and he I, I think he started having some um like he started having some issues down the line where uh it's probably like he was a little naive, you know, like a little, not naive is not the right. He thought too good of people, maybe. Well, what do you think about their relationship? Oh, though? between him and John? Um, I think th- there might have been a little bit of an attraction there. Like, I think Brian was probably really enamored physically, romantically of John. And uh, and so that that was part of like one of the ingredients into his, I think he overall just, you know, admired the hell out of John. Um, and maybe it was a little parental, you know, like, like an older brother sort of thing. Right. You know? That's my take on it is father, older brother kind of thing. And because now, of course, John and all the Beatles had a complicated multifaceted relationship with Brian Epstein, but John, given his issues with authority and with, yeah. with parents was not always very nice to Brian Epstein. Oh, I didn't realize that. Again, not talked about. Not talked about. Not talked about, but there were reports from, you know, credible sources that John would bully Brian sometimes. Oh. Because, again, he, John naturally doesn't like authority very much. Yeah. The cop that ran over his mom, his mom, his dad, uh, you know, all these people that have let him down. And, and he's like, screw those people. And so Brian Epstein, kind of a father figure, he, uh, Brian Epstein was Jewish and gay, and John would call him a faggot, and he would make fun of him being Jewish. Oh. And there were multiple accounts of this Yikes. kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, you could see it as perhaps a friend ribbing another friend. Yeah. But other people are like, no, John was abusive to Brian yeah. Epstein. And, you know, Brian just took it. So so that's another thing that they don't talk they about. They don't talk, yeah. Okay. And John would, I think, later on sort of admit to some of this stuff. Oh. So again... Yeah, that's uh, not the picture I had. <laughs> right. Now, they also had a good relationship, yeah. and they also probably joked around. They also probably had a very caring relationship because they yeah. were together all the time, especially during the touring, touring years right. of... 63 to 66, but it wasn't all roses. 1962, Stuart Sutcliffe dies. This is another massive blow yep. to John, and John reportedly cried for days. So yet another loss in the life of John Lennon. Yeah. Ringo came to the band, and they hey, were- By the way, sorry. That was a weird one, too, because it was like a, a tumor, a brain tumor or something. Like no, a tumor. it was- not an aneurysm. It could have been an aneurysm, but it was. It's unknown what caused it. But the theory was that during the days that Stuart and John and the rest of the Beatles were in, in either uh, Britain or Germany, they would get into a lot of fights. Yeah, because John John would get drunk and get yeah. in fights, and Stuart got hit in the head really hard once. Yeah. And then complications from that later led to him uh, okay. having some kind of... But it was so sudden and he was so young. Right. It's like, what the heck? Ringo came to the band and they recorded Love Me Do and it hit the charts. And the rest is a fast rise to becoming the most popular band of all time. As I said, best-selling band in history, over a billion units sold. Um, guess how many hits in 1964 they had? Uh, top 40 hits. Oh, top 40. Not even just, num- we're talking one year. One year. One year. 64. On the charts, yeah, they must have had like, probably like top 10 songs. 12. 12 songs. 12 wow. songs in the top 40. <laughs> no, no, 12 songs at one time. Oh my God. You're right, the different, so at one time. At one time. Top 40 songs, 1964, 12, 12 songs. 12 songs. So, you know, Can you imagine, like, you know, like you're in a band and you're like, hey, guess what? We broke the top 40. No, no, it's, hey, guess what? 12 of our songs are in the top 40. Uh, John Lennon actually <laughs> accidentally got his girlfriend pregnant. It's unknown if that was the only woman he was seeing at the time. Sure. Cynthia Powell. 
So he proposed to... Is this Julian? Yeah, this is Julian. So Cynthia and Julian. He's the first Beatle to get married. They kept it secret for the most part. Um, what do you know about his relationship with Cynthia? Um, I don't remember much. I just know that... I, what I do remember is that like, he started growing apart and... Um, it didn't, it didn't like, it wasn't like conflictive, I don't think, but it just, like he, he started distancing himself. Um, interesting. So yeah, that's sort of the narrative that they'll give is yeah. like he was on the road all the time and yeah. maybe he wasn't really in love with her to begin with, blah, blah, blah. And all that is true. But also he was physically abusive to her. Well, he did admit that in the songs, right? Right. Which we'll get into later. I used to be mad at my woman. And I beat her and, her and kept her, her away from, from the, the things, things that, that she loved. loved. Um, Man, so, mean. yeah, he he was a classic domestic violence perpetrator. Wow. He would get jealous. He would he was controlling. Yeah. He would beat her to control her. He would oh. beat her when... So he was, he was, you know, borderline and narcissistic. So... Oh she could incur his wrath if she were to give any hint that she was going to move away from him, even yeah. though he neglected her all the time. Right. And if she didn't stroke his narcissism, then she could also get beat. Oh, my God. So not all borderline narcissistic people are domestically violent, but if you're of a certain threat, beyond a certain threshold of borderline and or narcissism, you are going to mistreat your spouses. You, Be- because your spouses are going to trigger your traumas and are going to make you feel so much in pain that you're going to resort to things that you wouldn't do normalize to yeah. m- to prevent that person from hurting you in the future, even though they didn't really hurt you. It just touched on a trigger for you, but you don't know that because you have a personality disorder. Right. Oh, my God. Horrible. And he was paranoid that she was cheating on him, even though he was probably cheating on her the whole time. Yeah. So it's really awful to think about. Like again, I've seen, you know, I'm 47 years old. I, I've probably been a super fan since I was 15 years old. And yeah. I never knew he beat Cynthia. They don't talk about that in the documentaries. Yep. It's pretty awful. That's horrible. Julian is born, named after Julian Assange? <laughs> Ju- Julia. Oh, duh. <laughs> right. I'm glad you didn't draw that connection because... I didn't draw that connection. I, I never... It never occurred to me, but if, that makes total sense. <sighs> that makes sense. <laughs> I just... It's so funny. I have a real... I have a real disconnect when it comes to like names that are one sex versus the other and that they're related. Like this has happened to me many times where I'm like... Oh, that's the masculine version of that. You know, that's the feminine version. Yeah. yeah. I think I'm, I'm similar. What's the feminine version of Umberto? Umberta. I don't know. There isn't really. How do you feel about Beto O'Rourke? He has, oh, right. Well, he, what's funny is since I was called Beto a lot, every time I saw like, vote for Beto, I'm like, oh, is, am I running? <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> yeah, he did a great campaign. He, came ver- he, he did amazing things. Is he Hispanic at all? He must have some Hispanic in there. But O'Rourke is not a Hispanic yeah. last name. Oh, yeah. Um, so to Julian, John would say, and because he's still alive and giving interviews and stuff, that, so what's your knowledge of Julian's relationship with John? Yeah, I mean, I guess, so there was Julian and Sean, right? Yeah. So I always had this impression like Julian saw less of his father than Sean. That's true. And so therefore, but, but I always, and again, this is my eighties understanding of all this is I always thought of Julian as like looking up to his father and wanting to be like his father. And, and, and I'm only basing this on the fact that he looked like him, had long hair and played a song that sounded like a song that John might've written or something. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Again, in the documentaries, they kind of glance over this, but they don't go into what really the details of it. Yeah. Um, according to one article, uh, Julian will be saying, uh, my father severely emotionally, ab- no, no, sorry. This is a, this is a, uh, this is an article written by someone else. John Lennon severely emotionally abused his son on several occasions, oh my God. berating and screaming at him until the boy was re- reduced to tears. Uh... Once Julian giggled 
And Lennon shouted back, I hate the way you fucking laugh. <sighs> Julian, oh. Julian later stated that Paul McCartney was more of a father to him than his real father was. Oh, so heartbreaking, dude. Another article, this is, this is Julian talking. Julian said that after his birth, after Julian was born, he only lived with his father for a couple of years. And then here's some quotes from Julian. After that, I only saw him a handful of times before he was killed. Sadly, I never really knew the man. Oh. I had a great deal of anger towards dad because of his negligence and his attitude to, to peace and love. So it's not like he learned music from his dad. His dad just wasn't around. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, he says um, that his dad was so into peace and love, but that peace and love never came home to me. Huh. So it's just awful. Oh, man. Just awful. Yeah. But again, when you're young, and John would later say this, and you have attachment problems and attachment traumas, it's, it distorts things, yeah. you know? He grew up with parents who did not care for him and rejected him and abandoned him. So when John has his own son, he's looking at his son, you know, when you're raised well enough with, you know, relatively few attachment injuries and a child enters the world, you look at that child, it's, it's a compelling force that, that forces you toward that child. Right. Especially when it's basically socially understood that you're in charge of that child's right. well-being. Right, right. And especially as that child kind of comes to you and asks you for things. Well, if you're abused and neglected and, and abandoned when you're a child, you literally don't have neurons that are the same as other people do. You don't have the same connections. And so you look at this other, you know, human being and you're just like, what, what, you know. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. Uh, because, you know, parenting is incredibly inconvenient. Right. Incredibly inconvenient. Right. But people l love to do that because they have neurons and neur neuronal connections that involve love and attachment yeah. and stability. It rewards them in a different way than the inconvenience they're feeling. Right. Yeah. That's what compels parents. It, right. it just feels good because it's a reenactment of the feel-good experiences they had when they, re mm. when they received that. But if you don't have that. If you don't receive that, then you don't get the same dopamine charge <laughs> from, from that same behavior. It's just the inconvenience. <laughs> it's just the inconvenience. Holy crap. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, every parent wants to scream at their kid about little things, like yeah. stop doing that, you know. Right, right. But, you know, most parents who have, you know, normal attachment security don't act on those things or they modify it somehow. So, yeah, that's a story they don't talk about. Yeah. But Julian Lennon is quite open about this, you know. Wow. No, that's true. It's been so sanitized over... The, uh, one, one, the flip side on this whole thing is... I, I do hope that we, because, you know, right now, imagine right now uh, a famous musician, it comes out that that he beat his first wife and he abused verbally, verbally or maybe even physically abused his first child. That person is done. Right right now, they're done. Their, their career's over. Maybe. They're done. Depending. But maybe, yeah. But, well, that may, sure, to, to some degree, but... Depending and, on their position, you know, like if, you know, Mick Jagger comes out or something or... Well, and by that, yeah, sure, but there. I guess look at Usher. All you get, or not Usher? Sorry, uh, Chris, Chris, Chris uh, Brown. But Chris Brown stuff came out several years ago. It was before the Me Too movement. Before, like, kind of. Like, but he was Chris things. Brown is still hated by a lot of people. Yeah, Chris. that's true. Anyway, anyway, well, what I was trying to get your, at though, that's proving your point. Yeah, what, but what I was trying to really get at is, it's not to say that those aren't horrible realizations. That's horrible. What's interesting though is, Lennon, lived, even though he sadly was killed. You know, he was still very young. He lived enough years to start coming out of the other side going, oh my God, I was a bad person, right? And and what's interesting is like, we, we're not building a, sort of a model in society where people can learn and overcome their own abuse that they suffered and therefore the, the abuse they're inflicting is because they never overcame their abuse. Well, I don't know. I, I think that... Obviously, we're not doing enough, but I, there are examples like Jay-Z, actually, when this is not the same thing, but it's similar. In his early years, he would rap about misogynistic, you know, things and 
call you know women bitches and yep. lots of really horrible things. His videos would be objectifying, and he would give interviews about like, hey, this is just how you know it's just how guys are. It's how this yep. you know that's how we are in the streets. You know, fuck you. This is how we are. And he would you know rap about violence and that's right. killings and stuff. And I listened to him. I think he was on Fresh Air with Terry Gross. You know, just a couple of years ago. And Terry Gross asks him about because it's a very it's a very NPR or you know uh, public radio thing to do to ask a rapper about yeah. you know it's like you got to ask that question because um, that's what their listeners want to know and I actually was curious of the answer and I was expecting Jay Z to be like well you know it's the streets you know yeah. I was I was just speaking from my experience because right. that's what they always say that's my this is my world you know get a, get away from me white person interviewing me you don't know my world this is right. my world. But what he said was something completely different from that. What he said was, well, when I was young, me and all the guys I hung out with, we were incredibly insecure. And we didn't have a way of asserting that, or, or we didn't have a way of, of coping with that fear and insecurity. And so we would make up this persona that we were tough. Yeah. And one of the ways that you signal to every this is my words, you yeah. know, paraphrase. One of the ways that you signal to everyone that you're tough is you're misogynistic, that that you don't care about bitches and you don't ca- you don't care about violence and you're not afraid. But we were all just scared little boys. Yeah. And I I just celebrated when I heard him say that because I've always thought that was the case. Right. You know, all that posturing and all that machismo, I'm like my God, those guys have to be insecure. Right, but, but so you, this, he's the exception in that, not that he's the only one, I'm just saying, like, going through that cycle, and he obviously experienced a lot of success, and so he's probably had a lot of new windows opened up in his mind about the world and all these things. So he's come to this realization he's not been killed at well, a young age. Well, and he's more mature. And he's more mature, right. But what I'm saying is, like, if you take right now... Uh, you find out that you know this one twenty-two-year-old guy is beating his girlfriend, right? So the first part that happens makes sense. Everyone's like, "Oh, that's terrible! Stop it! Arrest him! Do that!" Okay, fine. Yeah, it's terrible. You got to stop it. That's not acceptable. But what never happens is, "Oh, let, let's talk about this. Why are you doing like? What happened to you?" Right. And, yeah. And that's what never happens. It's right. Like, exactly. When I treat domestic violence, intimate partner violence perpetrators. I often find that they suffer from borderline or narcissism or some other personality disorder or paranoid personality disorder. And I always find that underneath all that, the reason why they have that personality disorder is because they had a childhood like John Lennon. And they are suffering greatly and they have massive traumas about abandonment and about being harmed by other people and they will lash out. Similar to the way a Marine vet coming back from the war in Afghanistan, when he hears a loud explosion, he thinks it's an IED and he, his whole body goes into a state of shock mm-hmm. and terror and he might be a little irritable in that moment. Right. That's exactly the same neuronal experience of John Lennon coming home after being on tour, seeing his wife whom he probably has some attachment to and she is a little cold t- towards him. And that, that is like a loud explosion going off in his mind of reminding him of his mother who wasn't very loving to him, would abandon him. And then John would feel extremely hurt and then would engage in some kind of, you know, verbal parlay with her. You know, Cynthia would probably try to defend herself and, and you know it would escalate, and then John would start beating her. Yeah, um, it's not moral; it's not a justification, but it is a reason right. that a good moral human being would resort to something as awful as that. Right. Nineteen sixty-four. John was informed that he had a half sister. So remember that. Yeah, yeah. And he he had never known about that. Oh wow! <laughs> and he found out that she was adopted in Norway. And again, how do you think he reacted to this? Because this is the one that, that she was forced to give up. Right. So this is yeah. the one that was born just after he was born. Right. Uh, well, I think that he, to follow his pattern, he was, 
he was pro. Oh, one of two things. Either he was like, oh, new person in my life. I'm gonna go obsess about her, and this is my Julia replacement. Or it was too painful because it represented Julia abandoning someone like him, and then he in turn was turn a cold shoulder. Very astute. It's the first one. Okay. He became obsessed with her. He was really upset about it. Again, a massive loss. He hired people. He put ads in the paper to try to find her. Yeah. He hired detectives to try to find her. And it's so funny, in today's world, you would so easily find that person. Right. <laughs> but back then, you couldn't. And guess what? They never found her. <gasps> to this day, they've never found John Lennon's sister. Oh, no. You're but, kidding me. Yeah. Wow. Because the way they did adoptions back then, it was... You know, they would just burn the records. How did he find that he had a sister? Uh, I don't know. I mean, they would have known in the family. Yeah. You know, Julia, okay, someone in the family. Aunt Mimi would have known, blah, blah, blah. Like, by the way, something I need to tell you is you yeah. had a sister. Okay. At 1964, of course, there's lots of songs that John wrote, but I want to highlight one. It's one of my favorite Beatles songs, I Don't Want to Spoil the Party. Mm. So this is in line with this borderline. And I just want, so when I read these lyrics, I'm like, because, you know, love songs have a borderline quality to it, you know? Don't yeah. ever leave me. I can't live without you, you know? Well, oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. But there are certain songs that John wrote that are, I think, particularly... Because there's, there's a specificity to the lyrics where you're like, oh, that's, that's a specific to the what we understand to be... What I understand to be John's personality. Well, and, and before you get to this one... As you've been just saying that, and everything we've been discussing about him being abusive, all of a sudden songs like "Run you Better for your Run life. for yeah. Your well, Life," we'll get, you can't we'll, live we'll get to that in a second. Uh, oh. Right. So I don't want to spoil the party. Um, I've had a drink or two. I've had a drink or two, and I don't care. There's no fun in what I do if she's not there. there. I wonder what went wrong. I've waited far too long. I think I'll take a walk and look for her. Though tonight she's made me sad, I still love her. If I find her, I'll be glad. I still love her. So, so it's a it's a specific love song in that he's talking about being hurt by her, right? And he's drinking, which is in line with John, and he's you know he's wondering what went wrong, and but he also needs her so much. There's no fun in what I do if she's not there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'll take a walk and look for her, you right. know, and he's talking to a friend. And so, and it's funny cause like you as a listener, you know, everyone could sort of maybe relate to that general feeling like, like, oh yeah. Like when you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend and you like break up, it's so painful. And, but he's literally describing his feelings. Right. <laughs> when you know about his true life, right. it puts a totally different spin on the lyrics. Right. 1965, other songs that he wrote during this time that are notable, I think, revealing to his personality. Uh, what songs from 65 can you... Th- I mean, Run, Run For Your Life is one of them, but but there's a he wrote a number of songs in this year. Isn't Day in a Life 65? No, that's 66? 67. 67? Well, Sgt. Pepper is 67. But they wrote, no, but he wrote it in 66, probably. Maybe, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Okay, but anyway, 65. Uh, like, Nowhere Man. Yeah, that's one. And... Uh, so in my life, in my life, right, and help. Which actually, it's funny that in my life is that early on, yeah, because that one sounded like a little more down the down his rubber soul revolver are sixty five sixty four and help. I think help rubber soul and revolver are the three best albums that they had. By, by the way, I, I I was just listening to revolver a couple days ago, and it had been a while since I listened to it back to back. First of all, I kept thinking in my head it was like 10 songs. You mean long. front to back. Oh, uh, yeah, front to back. <laughs> I, I kept thinking in my head it was like 10 songs long. Yeah. And But, you know, a song would come on. I'm like, oh, my God, I, this song is in this album. That's crazy. And then the next song, I'm like, oh, my God, this song's in this well, album. Well, if you had the American Revolver, it probably did have 10 songs. Because that the American versions, oh, maybe, yeah. they would they would, you know, Strip chop out. up yeah, yeah. to sell more records. Well, this was the... This was the full one. So right. 14 songs. Right. And so, but... So but I, I mean, I'm just saying... Right, right. You, if you, I remember... When you were right, you, That's probably right. I probably remember. And so then we're getting through and it's getting to like the the 10th song. And I'm like... 
And I keep being amazed of just how many good songs there are in that album. Yeah. So, so the song Help, when I, w- when I was younger, so much younger than today, I never needed anybody's, anybody's help, help in any anyone, way. Right. So this is, this is the narcissistic mantra. I, right. I, I didn't need anyone's help. I want to get back to that. You know, I, I was okay on my own. Right. Of course, that wasn't true. Right. But now these days are gone. I'm not self, self-assured. Yeah. Now I find I've changed my mind. I've opened up the doors. Yeah. Help me if you can. I'm feeling down. Yeah. And I do appreciate you being around. Yeah. Help me get my feet back on the ground. Won't you please, please help me? I mean, me. he's screaming out yeah, for but help. It, but it's sung Literally. in a, but it's sung in a jangly major Isn't chord. Isn't that amazing? Like that was one of the things that they did so well. They presented this little pop veneer, especially John, with these like, oh my God, he's screaming for help. Right. And John loved that song. Like years later, he would yeah. talk about how Help was one of his favorite uh, compositions. Nowhere Man. Uh, he's a real nowhere man sitting in his nowhere land. So this is John talking about himself. So yeah. I always thought this song was more psychedelic. You yeah, know? Right. It was like about a nowhere man you yeah. know, who he was talking about Nixon or something. Yeah, you know? yeah. But he's talking about himself. Yeah. He's a real nowhere man sitting in his nowhere land, making all, all his, his nowhere plans. nowhere plans for nobody. He's yeah. just like, I'm nobody. I'm I live in a nowhere land, and I'm making all my nowhere plans for nobody. For nobody. Wow. I, doesn't have a point of view. Knows not where he's going to. Isn't he a bit like you and me? Yeah. Nowhere man, please listen. So he's talking to himself. Yeah. You don't know what you're missing. Nowhere, man, the world is at your command. He's talking. So this is at a time when they're at the yeah. height of Beatlemania. Height. And he's like, John, you know, so to himself, he's suffering. And he's like, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. But he's like, don't you understand? The world is at your command. Yeah. He's as blind as he can be. Just sees, what's he, just sees what he wants to see. So he is, this is a, a classic borderline narcissistic uh, state where you don't have a self. You can't soothe yourself. Right. And you're suffering in a great way. Totally changes my idea of this song now that I understand his personality. Another song in my life. Uh, why don't you do the lyrics? You have this is your favorite song, there right? Are, not my favorite, but it's one. It's my mom's favorite song, actually. Oh, it is definitely one the, of my favorites. In the past, you've said it was one of your favorites. Oh, I might. Oh, of John's. I might uh, have said of it's all my time of the Beatles. Um, I could have swore you said this was your favorite Beatles my, song. No, if I did, I was high on. On mushrooms that day, <laughs> just because it would, it would be impossible for me not to have a Paul McCartney song be my number one. Okay, uh, so but sing, still, sing the lyrics. There are places I remember all my life, though some have changed, some for better, not for some for ever, ever not for better. Uh, some have gone, and some remain. All these places had their moments <laughs> with lovers and things. Friends. Friends I still can recall. Some are dead and some are living. In my life, I love them all. Right. So in this song, he is talking about Julia. He's talking about his his, his, uncle. his uncle. He's talking about Stuart. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's just interesting, again, to think about how important relationships were to him. Yeah. You know, in a, the the stereotype is that Paul is the sentimental one and John is not. Right. But when you really look closer at it, John was much more sentimental. Oh, yeah. Paul's songs are very detached, actually. Yeah. Like, even his sentimental songs. I, you could say, oh, yesterday's... No, but yesterday is sort of a... Now, look, I love Paul McCartney. Yeah. But when it comes... To, when you look at his lyrics... His lyrics are what someone who doesn't fully understand those sentiments yeah. would expect those sentiments to be. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to go that far. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go that far. I'm just going to say that Paul, because he was raised well enough, but had a narcissistic streak, wasn't as vulnerable as John was. So when you compare right. yesterday to um, Norwegian Wood or to, uh, hey, you've got to hide your love away. So in fact, that's probably a better comparison. Yesterday, you've got to hide your love away. I think they were written in the same year. You've got to hide your love away is so much more vulnerable. Yep. You know, here I stand head in hand, turn my face to the wall. Yep. Like 
that is sad. I mean, so yes, and, and, and yeah. can't come from any other place than than reality. Absolutely, a song like yesterday, you could see how someone would just, you know write that song and it would be okay that I, I guess that encapsulates an experience I might have had but here I stand head in hand turn my face to the wall you know feeling two foot small that comes from a place obviously that John was feeling at the time right so like uh, certainly later and and especially in Paul's solo career Paul grew and evolved and got a lot more personal and things like in that. fact one of the best examples of this was a song that John Paul wrote about John after he died, right. um, which uh, I'm trying to remember the tune of it. Um, there are the what is that to do? Does you were here today? Yeah, yeah. The here today, like it's yeah. it's a beautiful, beautiful song and very heartfelt yeah. and like so he vulner- vulnerably sung and blah, absolutely. Blah, blah. So he he of course grew. It, what I what I mean is like. And this actually, when I was younger, me and my friend Shun, we would get in debates about the Beatles, and he he loved John a lot more than he loved Paul. I loved Paul a lot more than I loved John. And it actually made sense with our personalities, because see, I had a similar kind of happy-go-lucky, so if I'm going to write a song about love, it's going to be about like some idealized version of love, not about true pain or true... like. Well, right. and more broadly, your personalities are more of the templates of John and Paul. Absolutely. Now, as I grew older, by the time you and I were doing music, I actually was writing, starting to write a lot more about sort of real feelings, but, you know, still a mix of like idealized and some of my feelings, right? And then as I wrote my set of songs I wrote with Pla- Plastic Poly, a lot more real stuff came out. Certainly the piano songs I've written. That's as real as it gets. Yeah. But when when's I that, look, when's that? Never. <laughs> when I look at at Paul, would you? I, I did a recent deep dive on perfectionism. Yeah. Would you? So to those people out there, we've talked about this before. Berto has spent thousands upon thousands of dollars and years of his life flying down to L.A. and re- and recording with a s- session band and producers and everything. Just I believe ten songs, right on yep. on piano which I'm guessing are amazing tracks, even without any production, and you have yet to release them to anyone to listen. Well, it, part, part of the problem is there's a logistic problem in that they're not, uh, they're not mixed. There's, but, uh, I'm, some mis- but again, I'm guess who cares, yeah. even if they're not mixed well. Like, <laughs> you know you can mix them. Sure. I can mix them. Sure, sure, sure. You and I have mixed. We've mastered. Yeah. We're not amazing, but we're probably like... 95 percent as, yeah, go, as yeah. good as someone else can be um and is that a perfectionistic thing like are you worried that it's not going to be perfect are you well i mean part of it is i i guess i could i could request the the raw tracks and part but, of it is but I don't why have did the, it the but masters forget tracks. about maybe yeah. now because maybe that ship yeah, yeah, has yeah, sailed right. to you why for the five years you were doing it was it impossible for you to actually complete that? Project? Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, that was a mix of perfectionism. Also, like uh, specifically what, like worrying about. Well, you know? part of it honestly was I wasn't good enough yet for the songs I had written. And as you know, when you have to record them, it's a very different thing than when you just write them. Good enough on piano, uh, on piano and singing. Oh, really? I actually say more on the singing side. Than so on you the piano wrote side. vocal parts that you couldn't sing, that I couldn't sing consistently enough to record them well. Wow. Now, but Why didn't you just rewrite the parts? I, I just don't didn't know. Remember, I wrote these songs like twelve years ago, okay. right? But now I actually like have most of the tracks pretty close to done. Now it's more of a logistic silliness of like I just need to schedule a time that works for both of us to fly down there, finish up the bits of things, and be done with it. Well, don't you, know? you have all the backing tracks recorded? Yeah, I just don't just, have them. But just get them. Yeah, and I could just finish get it up here. Yeah, that's a good point. But. You what paid was, for it. Yeah. I mean, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. Um, what, the what, listeners want to hear those songs. They, they do. I, I think they do. What I was trying to say, though, was with Paul, uh, a lot of his early songs, they are so well-crafted pop songs. Um, but the lyrics, the meaning of it is a lot more superficial. Right. Some of them are touching, but, but the right. ones that are touching are almost a little third person. Well, yeah. Like, I mean, like for no one? It, it's it's hard it's hard to really generalize like that um i think i agree 
if we're going to compare John and Paul, this is definitely true. Yeah. But I think there are some songs that I don't, I can't really tell how Paul actually felt about the songs, but I'll tell you, they, they get me. Oh, absolutely. And I, like I said, my favorite Beatles song and maybe like if I, if I did a top 10 Beatles, most of them, would, a lot of them would be Paul songs. So I actually did this. Um, so I, I, you I, and I ranked, remember yeah. we ranked and a lot of my tops were Beatles. So were, 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 of course they were, Beatles. but well, we'll get into that in, in a bit because, uh, it, it'll come up. But anyway, uh, so again, you mentioned run for your life. So let's, let's read these lyrics yeah. in light of our knowledge yeah. that John was physically abusive in a classic sense to Cynthia. He wrote this song while he was married to Cynthia. I'd rather see you dead, little girl, than to be with another man. You uh, better keep your head, yeah, little, yourself, little girl, yeah. or or you won't know where I am. Where you better am. you better run for, for your, your life, life if you can, can little girl. girl. Hide I your head in the sand, little girl. girl. Catch, Catch you with, with another, another man. man. That's the end, uh, little girl. And well, I you, always thought that was kind of a cute little song. Right. C- totally. Until I did this deep dive this week. I was like, oh my God. Well, it's just a cute song. He's just being. I mean, he's it's, exaggerating. It's hyperbole. Of course. Well, you know that I'm a wicked guy and I was born with a jealous mind. And I can't spend my whole life trying to make you toe the line. Uh, you better run for your life if you can, little girl. Hide your head in the sand, little girl. Catch you with another man. That's, that's the end, end, little girl. Let this be a sermon. I mean, everything I've said. Baby, I'm determined, and I'd rather see you dead. Dead. I mean, the the song opens with "I'd rather see you dead." I'd rather see you dead than to be with another man. Yeah. Yikes. Uh, 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 Yikes. That changes a lot. <laughs> and and then he tops it off at the end. Let this be a sermon. I mean, everything I've said. Yeah. Baby, I'm determined, and I'd rather see you dead. And what's crazy is. At the time, they had all these gaggle of followers, and you you can imagine them singing it and sort of taking it as like, oh, he loves her so much. Right. And mores were different at the they time. They were, yeah. Where you could even potentially admit that these lyrics were literal. Yeah, yeah. And people would be like, similar. Yeah, and, and even to the point of, pro- I could imagine someone saying, well, I mean, if you catch your lover with someone else, what else are you going to do? Right. 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 Uh, did you know that in 1965, Alf, John Lennon's father, released a record? <laughs> no. So my deep dive has, has brought so many things. What? John Lennon's father in 65 released yeah. a record. Yeah. Called That's My Life, My Love, and My Home. I encourage you, everyone, to Google this song. It's, he actually changed. He has, a, he has a, a stage name called Freddie Lennon. What? Well, he's not alive, is he? No. Okay. A quirky little song uh, in which he mostly talks, and he sings exactly like John Lennon. No way. Yeah, it is crazy. Oh, my God. The whole song is about him referring to the sea. The quotes are, I make no excuses for my abuses. I could blame the cruel sea for taking you away from me. Oh, my God. So the whole song is him basically talking about uh, his life, his love, and his home is the sea. And he's kind of like... It's an apology to Julia and to John, I think. Wow. And guess who played in the band, you know, the session musicians, drum drummer Mitch Mitchell and bassist Noel Redding. Do you know those names at all? The, Mitch Mitchell and Noel Redding? No. Jimi Hendrix experience. Oh, <laughs> what? Yeah. So, I mean, he must have got those connections because of who he was then. No, this is before the Jimi Hendrix experience. So, later, those oh, guys okay. became... Oh, right, 65. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John and Brian Epstein were reportedly furious when this album came out, when this record came what? out. They They saw it as Freddie trying to do a cash grab. Uh, you know, it's sort of be like Jay-Z has a sure. long-lost father... And in the in nineteen, why do they care though? Well, because it un- damages. Because it, it well, it could look like, like I could see Epstein being upset about it because it could look like it was a Beatles product because it sounds like John. Well, because it's John's dad, and it uh, could be seen as like the Beatles were okay. endorsing it or something. Okay. Um, and it was shit. Do you know what I mean? It was I like a, a shitty track, and okay. so. 
John uh, was interviewed about this, and he says, I saw him twice in, in my life till I was 22. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, but that's what he says. Um, when he returned, when he turned up after I'd, I had a few hit records, I saw him and spoke to him and decided I still didn't want to know him. Yeah. So John was very upset about his dad doing this and, and, uh, the record never went anywhere. And there's speculations that John and Epstein actually killed it, killed it somehow. 1966, they stopped touring. And instead of John rushing home and spending time with his family, he... Studio. He Well, he went to Spain to film that movie. Oh, right. The, my War, what was it? Yeah. How I how Won, I the, won war. the War. Yeah. At this time, he met Yoko Ono. So how do you... What's, what's the story of John meeting Yoko? Yeah, he's at the art gallery for her presentation. He doesn't really know her yet. And he sees a little thing where there's a ladder and there's like a little tiny thing and he has to climb the ladder and when he gets up he looks maybe there's a magnifying glass or something and it says yes and that was that it, if it had been no I, I wouldn't have been interested but it was yes so all bullshit <laughs> really so that might have happened yeah but Yoko Ono was a groupie for the Beatles what she was one of the Apple, um, what they call them, the Apple women, or I can't remember what they call really? them. Really? Yeah. Um, she was one of those women who would wait outside Apple Studios oh, okay. to try to like yeah. get an autograph or yeah, yeah. Get, you know, get a kiss. And it was reported that she once forced herself into John Lennon's limo between him and his wife. What? Yeah. Oh my god. So Yoko was, you know, one of those crazed groupies yeah. who had met John several times, like as a groupie and John Wait, was she groupie number nine? <laughs> yeah. And so uh the romantic story that she was just this happening, beast. you know, to have a art show that John happened to be at yeah. and then he fell in love with her is, you know, I guess partially true. Yeah. But they always leave out the fact that she was one of the groupies who would hang outside. Yeah, there. no, no, no. I mean, it, it it's completely misrepresented because I actually assumed the the assumptions when you hear that story are John and her didn't know each other at all. Right. He's just at an art show that she's and she's already sort of like this artist. And right. so they're almost on not equal footing, but they're they're both artists. Right. And then he goes and sees this and he's like, wow, this is a person and blah, blah, blah. Uh, whereas instead, this paints a very different picture. <laughs> instead, John is dating or having an affair yeah. with a, a groupie, groupie, essentially. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and a very intrusive right. groupie. So at this time, uh, he starts using a lot of substances in addition to alcohol, right. o- opiates, heroin, pot, LSD. This is a very common thing for people with personality disorders, particularly men. They self-medicate, as we've been talking about, to deal with the psychic pain. Just because he's famous doesn't take away his attachment injuries, doesn't take away the right. intense psychological pain that he's going through all the time. In and fact, all the, it could exacerbate things. Right. <laughs> all the, all the uh, incursions on his attachments, all the, all the triggers that he's going. He's sleeping a lot, and he was probably depressed, too. And Sleeping a lot, is that a uh, symptom as well? Yeah. If you're, one, depressed, you sleep a lot. Two, opiates, you know, oh, okay. you fall asleep a lot. Um, one of the big reasons why heroin and opiates are a big problem in America today is because opiates and heroin will absolutely take away. So John Lennon has a very common backstory. Yeah. I mean, you have a story that's similar yeah. to this there is very little that will ameliorate that pain for people. Mm. Therapy could take 20 years to get rid of that pain. There's, there's no SSRI. There's, you know, there's, right, there's right. nothing that will take it away, but what does take it away is heroin, heroin and right. opiates, Percocet, right. uh, Oxycontin. These things do take it away. Right. The problem is as you get, used to those drugs you need more and more of it to, to actually right. work and there are side effects like you could overdose on accident mm-hmm. so whenever i hear about the heroin epidemic what i really hear is an attachment 
epidemic. Wow. Uh, which is proven by research. Yeah. It's not an addiction problem. It's an attachment psychic pain problem. Wow. I mean, the addiction comes with the territory, but it's right. not the cause. How many people take opiates after a surgery or something? Right. And how many of them become massively addicted? Right. Well, they're, you know, it's those people who have been... Because you'll hear people with attachment injuries, they'll say, yeah, I had my wisdom teeth pulled, I popped a Percocet, and for the first time in my life, I felt okay. Wow. That's an in- oh my god! That's an intoxicating experience. Yeah, so that's a crazy thought. So yeah, pot can also help, kind of not as much as opiates can, and LSD affects serotonin, so it makes total sense that that would help him yeah. with his depression. This is when he wrote, "I'm only sleeping." Uh, and again, when I heard this song when I was a teenager, I thought it was more metaphorical. Yeah, totally, right? And, <laughs> it's just and, a and also, thing. And also yeah. kind of psychedelic. You yeah. know, I'm sleeping, I'm floating away. When I wake up early in the morning. I mean, I always lo- lo- liked it in that sense of like, because I could relate as, as a waking up for school and you're like, oh, dude, I'm not ready for this, you know? So I always thought of it like that. This was one of the first songs that I had heard. So as I was getting into the Beatles when I was a teenager, I would have to acquire these albums, right? Yeah. And Because you couldn't go on the internet and listen to music. You'd have to somehow get your hands on the albums. And there were times when I'd get a new album home and I'd put it on the record player to put the needle. And, you know, I would get to tracks that I'd never heard before. Right. I'd be like, this is a Beatles song I've never heard before. And when I got to I'm Only Sleeping, that I remember the moment I heard this, the, the first line, that first, that, that yeah. guitar sound, and it was like electric to me. I was like, how come I've never heard this Beatles song? It right. is one of the best one that's ever been written. <laughs> um, the Some of the lyrics go that typify, I think, what John was going through at the time. Everybody seems to think I'm lazy. I don't mind. I think they're I crazy. Think they're crazy. Running everywhere at such a speed till they find there's no need. Please don't spoil my day. I'm miles away, and after all, I'm only sleeping. Yeah. Uh, Paul, in interviews, w- would talk about this. They wouldn't. They would sort of gloss it over. They wouldn't talk about the heroin and the <laughs> opiates, but they would talk about how John loved to sleep, and they did talk about how John was always late to yeah. things. Yeah, I do. I do know that. You know, it's funny. So um, I did read a couple biographies back in in college that did go, and I don't know how much, because these were like the unauthorized biographies, so I don't know how much of it was exaggerated, but they, they tried to go a little more into the dirt, and so they talked about all their sex in Hamburg, and they talked about the drugs, and the fights, and all these kinds of things. And one thing that always struck me is, Paul always gave off this like very innocent, very boy-next-door vibe, but I mean, they were all... They, they, I mean, they were rock stars, you know, they, they, they all partied hard too. I think one of the big differences is Paul, I guess, had less internal damage. So he was able to pull up out of the, out of the nosedives with greater success. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. He only would rely on pot eventually. Yeah. Um, so 1967, he writes, uh, he, uh, Getting Better. Uh, with with Paul right. with Paul McCartney, but he writes some of the most key lyrics. Yeah. in this song, it can't get no worse. <laughs> um, I used to be cruel to my woman. Yeah. I beat her and kept her apart, apart from, from the things, things that she loved. loved. Man, I was, was mean, but I'm changing my scene, scene and I'm and doing, doing the best that I can. can. Ooh. Yeah. Um, so in this song, he is just flat out admitting yep. that. I used to beat my woman and I was cruel to her. <laughs> I and I would end, there's a key yeah. line here. I kept her apart from the, the things, things that, that she loved. loved. That's a classic DV yeah. perpetrator yeah. thing to do. And again, whenever I heard and sang this line, I just, oh yeah, these metaphors, aren't metaphors wonderful? But it's so funny. He spelled it out as clear as day. Yeah. Multiple times. And yet we all kind of like, yeah, I mean, you know, they're just lyrics. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, people like Charles Manson read into that as some other kind of thing when it's just like, nope, it's literally what he's saying. Brian Epstein died during 1967 of an accidental overdose. It's believed to, some people think it was suicide, but other people think it was accidental. It seems likely it was accidental. 
just after Sgt. Pepper came out. Again, a massive loss yep. for John Lennon. Uh, just tragic, just sudden, boom, just gone, right? Just imagine what that would be like for all the Beatles. And he was their glue, especially in those in those points, because, right. you know... And, he, and their, their dad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's review his losses up to this point. Abandon my dad, left at home by mom, abandoned my mom. Mom abandons him and has another family. Just She, yes. li- she lives just down the road. Oh, my God. Uh, dad Uncle. has another family. All oh, right, right. Uncle, dad dies. Yeah. Mom dies, dies tragically. Best friend dies tragically, Stuart. I mean, that's a lot of tragedy. F- he finds out he has a half-sister that he can't find. Yeah. And then his father figure, Brian, dies tragically. And he's 26. Oh yeah, right? Uh, 1968, he writes Julia. In India, he asked Donovan to help him write a song about childhood that he... he, he, he John goes to Donovan and says, help me write a song about the child that I never really had right. with my mom. Right. And, and Donovan says, well, when you think of the song, where do you imagine yourself? You know, when you think about the lyrics of the, this fantasy version of you and your mom, where do you imagine yourself? And John says, well, I'm at the beach and I'm holding hands with my mother and we're walking together. Uh, isn't that very sweet? That is very beautiful. It's the only track to only have John on it. Of course, Paul did many songs on his own, even going yeah. back to yesterday. But this is the only song Beatles ever did that John just didn't have any of the other Beatles on it. But by, by the way, I, I just watched a video on YouTube with Donovan talking about when they were in in India, and uh, so you know he had he was a really good guitarist and had this finger picking down, yeah. and uh, John was like, "How'd you do that, mate?" Right. And then so Donovan showed him. And so the way Donovan tells it, when he learned it, it took him, uh, I think he said like four days to pick up or something like that. And then, or maybe it was two days. And then he said, uh, oh no, yeah, it was four. Because then he said, John picked it up in two days. And then he said, George picked it up in one day. And then he said, now, of course, Paul, I didn't even show him. He just heard us doing it. And then like he immediately like got it. And he did it in his own way. And then he wrote Blackbird. And it was a really great story. That's funny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's the way they did things back then. Yeah. Again, because they didn't have YouTube. So no. to, to learn a new guitar picking scheme. But John, because he was the least you know proficient guitarist in the band, he used that pattern in a lot of different yeah. songs. Um, you know, band, dun, 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 dun. anyway, um, it's actually kind of a cool yeah. picking technique. But anyway, half of what I say is meaningless, but I say it just to reach you, Julia. Julia, Julia, ocean child calls me. So I sing a song so of love, I Julia. Sing a song of love. Uh, so, yeah, so, so he just, you know, he's just like, I, I want to be with you. I want to be with you. Well, it's still, I, actually, I, I never thought of this, but then it goes, Mm-hmm. It's almost like, yeah, there's not much more I have. Yeah. I just have the memory of it. Now, uh, the song was also about Yoko. And really? because Yoko means ocean child. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Or forgot it. It's funny. I probably have forgotten so much about the Beatles because, you know, I obsess so much and then it's been years. So. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, again, when I was a kid, Hearing the song, I didn't even know his mom's name was Julia. Yeah, no. I thought there was just some some, some girl, some bird named Julia. Um, interesting though that uh, so Julia was, or sorry, <laughs> Yoko was seven to eight years older than John. Did you know that? Mm, I knew she was older. I didn't know she was that much older. And uh, would eventually call Yoko mother. Oh, by the way. Which was which wasn't that unusual back then, you know. People make fun of Mike Pence for calling his wife mother, but in the olden days, like I think even my parents would do this. They would call each other mom and dad. Do you know what I mean? To their oh, face. Oh well, okay, but I could see it as in like because it's the mom of the house. It's like right. Oh, mom, would you? Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Right, but like, I, like sometimes yeah. I call my mom Bachan, which is Japanese for grandma, but it's like she's not my grandma and you know, she's my mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Anyway. But that's what everyone calls her because that's what the right, kids call her. Right, anyway, right. okay. So, so anyway, um, it just we'll get into more of that later. But the Yoko mother thing, mm. you know, kind of comes out in Julia a little bit. Um, he wrote "Jealous Guy." 
Right. Jealous guy now also has more significance too. Right. It's not just like, yeah, I'm a jealous guy. Everyone's a little jealous from time to time. So this is kind of him maturing. So this isn't run for your life if you can. This is, um, so I was dreaming of the past. And, and my, my heart, heart was, was beating, beating fast. fast. So in originally hearing that line, I was like, oh, he's in love. But really, he's probably terrified of what he's done to some of these yeah. people. I began to lose control. I began to lose, I didn't mean to hurt you. I'm sorry that I made you cry. Yeah. I didn't want to hurt you. I'm, I'm just, just a, a jealous, jealous guy. guy. By the way, uh, jealous guy is, it is quite possibly my favorite, but definitely top three John Lennon songs. Yeah. I was feeling insecure. You might not love me anymore. I was shivering inside. I was shivering inside. So again, to, you know, if you're just listening, you know, it's like, oh, it's a metaphor. It's a love song. He probably literally was feeling so insecure and he was so paranoid that Yoko or Cynthia wasn't going to love him anymore that he was probably literally shivering on the inside. Um, I was trying to catch your eyes, thought thought that you was trying to hide. I was swallowing my pain. I was swallowing my pain. So this is referring, I assume, he's at a public event and Yoko is across the room or something and he's trying to catch her eye like, hey, I'm. you're making me jealous right now. You're talking to some man mm. and I thought you were trying to hide yourself from me. I was really in a lot of pain. I was swallowing my pain. I, I'm, wow. sorry, I'm sorry that I hurt you. So by the way, you know, it's not a surprise that he beat the shit out of Yoko too. Yeah. I, I, I imagined that after what you said. Right. Um, uh. So by now in 1968, he's massively addicted to heroin, something they also gloss over. So I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. know he had a heroin addiction. Oh yeah. Massive problem. I always imagined it was like, you know, a little LSD, right. a little pot here. No. Nope. Little big, hashish. Big problem with, with heroin. Um, and it was hard to maintain. Holy crap. And his songwriting gets worse. So, so here's where I actually, so I, I went through every Beatles song <laughs> that I love. Yeah. And I got like top 35 or something. And so I made a spreadsheet. And of course, you didn't have time to do this. But so I tabulated all of them. So before this, before 68, before yeah. Brian Epstein dies, before his heroin addiction gets really in the full swing, when I tabulate, I have 44 of my favorite Beatles songs, half of them written by John, half of them by McCartney. Yeah. So, you know, you got songs like... I still have my, my list somewhere, by the way. Yeah. You got Day Tripper by Lennon. You got Hard Day's Night by Lennon. You got Ticket to Ride by Lennon. You got Paperback Writer by McCartney. You got Eleanor Rigby by McCartney. You have uh, With a Little Help from My Friends by McCartney. So it's half and half right down the middle. The, after the heroin addiction get, gets kicked in, after Brian Epstein dies... There are 11 McCartney songs that are in my top, you know, mm. and there are, but there are only five Lennon songs. And uh. of those five songs, four of them were written before, uh, before 68. Oh. Acro- Across the Universe was written while they were in India. Sex- <laughs> Sexy Sadie was written while they were in right. India. Strawberry Which is about the Maharishi. Uh, Strawberry Fields Forever was written in like 66, I think. Right, right. I Am the Walrus was written in like 67. The only song of mine, of one of my favorite songs that, that, that of John that he wrote after uh, his heroin problem was Come Together. And that's not even really... So give me a couple examples of songs that were after that that are bad. Cause like, well, not bad. Just or no, like, no, that, that weren't as good. Uh, other Lennon songs. Yeah. Um, everybody's got something to hide. Oh yeah. Uh, so well, monkey. Julia. Like I'm not a. I, I like Julia. I'm though. not a huge Julia fan. I like. But again, he wrote that. He actually, actually, no, he wrote that before his heroin addiction yeah. got really bad. Um, mean Mister Mustard. Uh, I me mine. I see. So a lot of them get to be a little bit more. Uh, Dig it. A little more weird. <laughs> Uh, let's see one one after nine oh nine, but he wrote that a long time ago. Anyway, so so yeah, but then when you think about McCartney, the long and winding road. Yeah, they only get better. Basically. Let it <laughs> let it be. Two of us. Uh, you never give me your money. That whole ending of the right. of it, it, and this all comes to light when you actually look at post magical mystery tour. John Lennon's contributions become so much less. Yeah, that's And actually, John would admit this. He would say, like, 
he would say, oh, those songs were crap. <laughs> like, I don't even know why we released that song. Yeah. Uh, McCartney, Oh Darling. Right. Uh, I Will, Paul McCartney, Blackbird, Obla Di, Obla Da. You know, yeah. so anyway. That's, that is, uh, I mean, it's not surprising because everyone seems to, everyone assumes like, oh, well, you know, the drugs is what made them so good. Oh, God. Like, no. What are you talking about? Like, most of the hits happened before they even went to India. <laughs> the, the Beatles themselves, when they're interviewed, will say, like, that's ridiculous. When we yeah. were super high, we were, I mean, it sort of helped to expand our mind, kind of. Right. But when you're high, you can't do anything. Right. Like, you right, can't, right. You, it's hard to do anything. Um, he, during this time, wrote, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. I haven't slept a wink. I do like that song. I'm so, that's yeah, a great song. My mind is on the blink. Yeah. I wonder, should I get up and fix myself a drink? No, no, no. No, no, no. I'm so tired. I don't know what to do. I'm so tired. My mind is set on you. I wonder, should I call you? But I know what you would but do. But I know what you would do. So, so that's such a borderline thing to say. Uh-huh. I wonder if I, I, I want to call you, but I know what you're going to do. Right. Uh, you say I'm putting you on, but it's no joke. It's doing me harm. I can't sleep. I can't, I can't stop, stop my brain. brain. No, it's two, three, it's three weeks. weeks. I'm going, going insane. Going insane. You know, I give her everything I've got for a little peace of mind. mind. So anyway, he gets into transcendental med- meditation with the Maharishi in India. Uh, but so I mean, I like this. this is yeah. when John discovers that there are answers to his pain that aren't drug related. Right. So he's always looking for answers to his pain. Right. And transcendental meditation provides some of those answers, and this kind of sows the seed for later therapy he gets into. At this point, he divorces Cynthia. Um, and wow, af- that late! <laughs> and after this, yeah, and after this point, he almost never saw Julian or her. Yeah, this is when Paul writes, "Hey Jude, hey Jude, don't make it bad. Yep. Take a sad song and make it better." So he's writing this song to Julian. Yeah. Such um, a good song. And Definitely one of my favorites. John thought that Hey Jude was giving John permission to be with Yoko, but it's so clearly about <laughs> Ju- Julian. Right. Um, and I think John was in psychological denial about, about that. So in this instance, we see that John's best friend is watching John exhibit his poor attachment to his son. Right. And because Paul was, had a stable relationship with his dad could recognize that and has so much love for the world actually reached out to Julian who wasn't even his own son. Right. And Julian would later say that Paul was more of a father than his own father was. 1969, he marries Yoko Ono. Um, and sh- Yoko was equally attachment problemed herself. I didn't realize he married her that late. Yeah. And she didn't like the fact that he had a child with a previous wife. So she encouraged John not to contact Julian. Oh. So not that John would have anyway, but... Um, so this is where we get into two attachment disordered people getting together and John really needing her and her, uh, really liking to be needed. So they had kind of a mutual attachment disordered relationship, very dependent on each other. The Beatles recorded their last album, Abbey Road, and they broke up. What do you know about their breakup? Well, uh, according to Paul himself, basically... John, John just didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> and he, you know, he, he came in and he said, yeah, I, I'm out. <laughs> why do you think they broke up? Oh, why? Why do you think John wanted to leave? Um, I mean, so th- there were a few factors. The, for one thing, he was probably not feeling good about himself. And he, you know, he, he was trying to change his life probably for the better but maybe he didn't see that the same things would work um he he certainly didn't see eye to eye at that time with paul he probably felt like paul was trying to control the the band and things like that um but yeah i don't know yeah the internet what they will say is that either yoko did it which obviously is an oversimplification or they'll say that paul was too controlling right but John was the one that left, and in my estimation, what, what happened was that um, it was a number of factors. One is that I think Yoko actually did have something to do with it. Be, not, be, not that she broke up the band, but that John, again, going from Obsessing that, with... Right. Yeah. Because he was a, a one-person person. Right. 
he had gone from Paul to Yoko now. And Yoko actually provided him with something that Paul could never provide him, which is like a sexual motherly connection. Yeah. And Yoko was more attentive than Paul was. You know, Paul's another dude and has other interests, right? Right. And so John, for the first time, has this relationship with a mother wife who he, you know, can completely de- be, to be dependent on and needs her so much that he brings her into the studio, which was mm-hmm. like a huge no no. Plus, it's like, um, you know, we've been in bands before. It's weird to have randos in the studio. Oh, totally. You know, it's like you need you need it to be as empty as possible. And then you have randos who one of the band members is like, well, why don't we do that one thing you were doing the other day? Right. Here, let's add you to the song. Right. So Yoko Ono, some people will say she was like a cutting edge avant-garde musician. I think... There's different explanations for what she was. <laughs> yeah. I would say that she had some interesting musical instincts, but she is not very... She's not as compelling as John made her it's sort of front and center on a lot of the albums. But anyway, so Yoko, you know, was a factor, but it was more John's relationship, his neediness with Yoko that made John completely shift his focus away yeah. from the band and towards Yoko. Right. And then, then because borderline people are all or nothing, if you're not in the good camp, then you're in the bad camp. Mm-hmm. And then John probably started treating everyone like shit at that point. Um, yeah. Not horribly, but you know, yeah. like not great. Well, so as you as you know, the the Let It Be experience was terrible for everyone involved. You know, recording the Let It Be album, and like George Martin was not involved. You know, he's like, I'm out, <laughs> right? And and then basically, they 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 had grown so far apart that it was like everyone was just kind of recording their own stuff, and it was right. like it was a mess. By the time they. Di- this is the other thing that's amazing. By the time they did Abbey Road, uh, which is really in real terms only like, what, one year later, two years later? From Let It Be? Yeah. It's like six months later. Well, they recorded when, Abbey Road in 69 and Let It Be was in 69 or late 68. I think it was early No, it was 69. like a year because- No, no, no. Yeah. Let It Be, they recorded Let It Be, that that you know album they were going to do on film. Uh-huh. Um, it was either late 68 or early 69. They recorded Abbey Road in later 69. Well, but then, because because the story was like, like uh, when they, when Paul, Paul was the one who was like, oh, we should do one last album, right? And then, uh, what's his name? George Martin didn't really want to do it at first, but he's like, well, I'll do it if John is involved. And, and it, and it was like, actually, this only oh, they, makes they, my, sorry, they recorded yeah. it from, uh, from through most of sixty eight, but this only makes my point even even if it was like six months, because the way they tell the story, it was like ten years had passed. The way they talk about it, like if you hear the interviews, right. they talk about it like ten years had passed, but really it was like like just like a few months or actually a year, you know? <laughs> technically it was a month because they rec- they ended recording on Let It Be in January of sixty nine. Yeah. And they started recording Abbey Road in February of sixty nine. Okay, but 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 they had started Let It Be a long time, like before a year that. before. And yeah. so George Martin had been sort of out of the process for a long time. Yeah. But a long time for them was a year. For us, a year is nothing. Right. So, but they they speak about it like we're getting the band back together. Yeah. Right. All right. But in in any case, what I was saying was that they had grown apart t- terribly in Let It Be. With Abbey Road, they sort of like pulled it together for one last hurrah. Well, and what I would say is that it was George Martin and Paul McCartney who basically had three other musicians playing with them. Yeah, (laughs) sure. Because when you look at John's contributions to that album, you don't see very much other than than come together, right? Uh, George was coming into his own, so he was contributing more. But... Like I said, that second half, the you know, the second side of that album is like all Paul. For I the mean, most part. John threw his songs in there, but they're arranged and put together, and yeah, Paul yeah. inserted them in there. You know yeah. what I mean? It, it was it was a grand scheme by by Paul. Yeah. Um, now people will say, "Well, that Paul's so controlling," and I would say, "Is like, well, just look at the he bigger picture." The, yeah, yeah, he he fucking salvaged that thing. 
Um, now, was Paul kind of a dick? I'm sure he was at times. So I would say Yoko was part of, part of the reason. I also think that they just kind of needed to be on their own. They had too much talent for one band. Yeah. I mean, you and I and Shun were in a band, and we had a similar situation where yeah. we're three front men who all wrote songs, all write pro- <laughs> prolifically, and are musicians. And and when we were in a band together, we would switch off. Each right. one of us would take turns writing the next song, and you know we would be in a we were in a band together for like a year. And I would have like three songs. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's and, true. <laughs> and we, we would be working all the time. And I was just like, you know, but to me, I didn't mind that because right. I'm, I'm not that narcissistic. Um, other people, I think you and Shun didn't like that. So no, much. no, no, no. I actually did. I loved our band. Oh, okay. I loved because the thing is the little bit of my psychology is not only am I narcissistic, I also want for my father to succeed. And so when I have my buddies and we're doing something together, oh. it's like my father's succeeding, right? Okay. And so I, the most important thing about music for me for the longest time was that I was in a band with friends. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I love that too. So anyway, but you can't imagine if our band became mega famous that... Uh, and you, you are totally. only able to release three songs absolutely. every four yeah, years. Yeah, it's frustrating. And, and, and the flip side is absolutely true for me, which is, as, as I've mentioned to you, the reason I don't really end up being able to play in cover bands, or, or it's not even cover bands, in other people's bands, is because I do want to do my songs. Right. So my, my uh, sort of like my uh, generosity with my time goes only so far. Yeah. Um, so I think that that was another factor. It was just like, I mean, you got Paul McCartney, John Lennon, and and George uh, Harrison. Ringo, God bless him. You know, <laughs> but but you have Great drummer, though. <laughs> you have three of the most talented songwriters of all time in the same band, and it's just hard. Uh, also, at the time after Epstein and after other people started to come in to to be managers and and money people, there was no agreed upon leadership. Yep, they needed a strong leader. Paul tried to be that person, but because John had sort of distanced himself, so I I would so if Yoko hadn't had come along, right? I'm not blaming it on Yoko. I'm blaming it on John. I'm blaming the breakup on John, and yeah, I think yeah. everyone would actually blame it on John. Yeah, yeah. But the um, if Yoko wasn't around and John was still looking to Paul for that relationship, and Paul stepped forward and said, I am now going to lead us while still kind of looking up to John. I think the Beatles would have stayed together because yeah. John would have been, well, I'm still in love with Paul, so I'll, yeah. I'll let him do that. Especially if he wasn't so much under the influence of, you know, if he was moving more towards the meditation, less the drugs, all those things. But even yeah. if he was on the drugs, that might have made it even more likely because he'd just be like kind of out of it all the mm-hmm. time. But because he was an all or nothing person, it was all Yoko. And when yeah. Paul stepped forward and said, I can lead us. Yeah. And look what he did with Abbey Road. Right, right. Uh, John was like, well, I hate that guy. Right. Because that guy is off my list now. He's in the bad list. And so yeah. I think, you know, that's why they happen. Um, okay. So again, another fat, huge loss yeah. of his relationship with Paul, George, and Ringo at this time. Um. So and and by the way, uh, their relationship was quite uh, tense all around. Uh, Paul McCartney was telling a story about how when Abbey Road was going to come out, uh, Paul had his first solo album coming out, right? And it was coming out like around the same time or something like that. Uh, so they sent Ringo to his house to, to, with a letter saying you can't release your album, and then Paul like probably for the first time or who knows like probably not but he kicked Ringo the hell out of his house like insulted him like kicked him out right. like angry angry Paul that we've never seen right imagine Paul McCartney like you motherfucker get out of my house um, so their their whole relationship at that point was a little strained you know right I would call it petty I think that they had been reduced to a situation of yeah. of, of pettiness yeah. And you know, and I think were, there, as, there was all that drama with the Apple company, and they lost a lot of money because there were some nefarious, right. involved people that didn't really. 
right. do them any favors either. And so this is when the so-called feud happened. And so John wrote, "How do you sleep about Paul, oh, Sergeant Pep- Sergeant Pepper took you by surprise. You better see right through that mother's eyes." Those freaks was right when they said you was dead. <laughs> the one mistake you made was in your head. How do you sleep? How do you sleep at night? You live with straight straight who tell, who you, tell you, you you was, was king. king. Jump jump when your mama tell you anything. The only thing you you've done was yesterday. yesterday yep. <laughs> and since you're gone, you're just another day. Oh so my gosh. That was because he just released a song called Another Day. Oh. A pretty face may last a year or two, but pretty soon they'll see what you can do. The sound you make is Muzak to my ears. You must have learned something in all those years. Oh, my God. Paul wrote a less scathing song called Three Three Legs. (laughs) There were actually a number of songs that they wrote back and forth, and George did too. Um, Well, apparently, I didn't know that... uh, that was your first mistake. Right. That one you, apparently was. That was surprise. your lucky break yeah, and that throw was it your away. Lucky yeah. break. Um, a dog is here. A dog is there. Yeah. My dog. He got three legs, but he can't run. So this is basically saying, you know, the 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 three left beetles. Yeah. They're they're a dog with three legs and they can't run. Right. Um, when I thought, well, I thought when I thought you was my friend. When I thought, when I thought, when I thought you was my friend. But you let me down. Put my heart around the bend. So it's more. It's more vulnerable. You know. Totally. It's him being hurt. Yeah. 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 Uh, and it fits their personalities in this flipped style. Because now Paul's the one being real, right? And John is being fake. Because well, that, that song, it sounds real. Like, oh, I'm telling you how I really feel. That's not how he really felt about Paul. Well, he admired the shit out of all. The, you know. True. And because John was borderline, he could become enraged for yeah. for periods of time yeah, yeah. and would have those sentiments right he, so so they, you're right so they were real sentiments in that they bubbled up but what what i mean but it is wasn't like, like a stall of his feelings no his and and it felt like if you listen to a song casually you're like oh that's an interesting song but for me at, as a fan at the time when i really listened to the lyrics i was like why are you saying these things? yeah he's such a dick yeah um and so it's interesting because all the documentaries the best people to ask questions like this are to Paul himself, right? Because yeah. John's not around. Yeah. So you have to ask Paul, like, so what was it like? And Paul is such a good interviewer yeah. that he knows, like, well, if I tell the truth, people are going to hate both of us. Yeah. Because it'll make John look really bad. Yeah. And I'll be associated with that. Yeah. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to kind of gloss over it a yeah. little bit. Minimize it a bit. Yeah. yeah and, and, and we'll all get out of here unscathed and, and the fans of the Beatles can still believe and right. that we are all like these cute little boys, you know, yeah. at this time, John wrote cold Turkey, which is about his heroin addiction. 1969 temperatures rising. Fever is high. Can't see no future. Can't see no sky. My feet are so heavy. So is my head. I wish I was a baby. I wish I was dead. Cold Turkey has got me on the run. Yeah. So that was one of his first songs on one of his first solo albums. So again, right there in the lyrics, he's talking about going cold turkey on heroin and going through massive withdrawals. Of course, he would not kick it. He, w- he would continually try to quit heroin and, mm. and not succeed. I suspect, and maybe there... So I should say that there's probably some John Lennon scholars who are already like writing me all these mistakes that I've written. And you know, it's fine if you want to say it, but I'm not... I'm, I'm not so excited about the minutia that some people get into. Yeah. But from what I understand, John never kicked his habit of, of heroin and probably up until the time he died, he was oh, still, wow. he was still using. I'm not, he could have, I think he might've had periods of sobriety mm-hmm. and maybe towards the end he had some sobriety, but anyway, so there was a, there's a number of years where he was using. Now that isn't to say that you can't live a functional life while you're using opiates. Yeah. I've had clients who were addicted to heroin addicted to opiates, Percocet, uh, on methadone, who lived perfectly normal lives. He wrote some of his best music ever. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I would say no, actually. What, what, what do you mean? What music? Like, imagine a jealous oh. guy, woman, a mother. Well, uh, you know. so woman might have been written when he was getting his head clear a little bit towards yeah. the end. Well, I'm not saying he wrote him while he was high. I'm just saying he, he didn't, like, not write anymore, right? Sure. Like, he was able to still. But when you compare his songography yeah. to Paul's, Oh no! And, no and maybe question. and maybe no even question. George's actually. It's like the number of like totally great hits. Yeah. What, what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, even though he was the one that wrote a little more from the heart, a little more real, like there was this subset of songs he wrote that were so emotionally bare. Yeah. Afterwards, you know, and, yeah. and, 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 and I guess now analyzing some of the things I learned, I, I look back at some of those earlier songs that I realized, oh, actually, those were emotionally bare lyrically, but not musically. Right. But these are both. So, the, one of the reasons for writing Mother, for example, was that at this point, 1970, he starts doing primal therapy or primal mm. screen therapy with Arthur Janoff. Uh, Mother! <laughs> right. So he and Yoko went to California for four months. Four months. They were doing primal therapy, basically in an inpatient primal therapy wow. like commune or whatever, yeah. institution. For four months, he and Yoko are doing primal therapy. Uh, do you know anything about the technique? Uh, just a little bit. Like you, you basically try to release your emotions in, in whatever ways they come out, including screaming and... And letting it all out, but that's about all I know. <laughs> that's that's pretty much it. And you can even be violent towards you know objects or even other people. And they the therapy allows for that. So isn't so, this not therapy, but like that uh, Rajesh cult? You uh, yeah, Raj about. Rajneesh. They, Rajneesh. They did this yeah. too. Yeah, it was a it was big. It was a big part of the West Coast. I'm watching that documentary. Oh, it's good, right? Oh my God, it is. Because I heard the beginning of your podcast. Oh. And I stopped because I didn't want it ruined. Oh. And I and I I'm like because the the way you introduce it, like I I started watching it and I couldn't believe. And then it they kept it surprising me. And yeah. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, I never heard of this. Yeah, well, it's more weird that I've never heard of it because yeah, I, right. I was actually living right, right, right. in Washington <laughs> at the time. Um, but anyway, uh, so yeah, it's a technique where you reenact traumatizing experiences of the past by screaming at the top of your lungs by, you know, beating yourself, by yeah. crying uncontrollably. You know, the whole idea is this, this massive experiential catharsis. And John at this time said that this therapy was something more important to him than the Beatles were. Mm. And he, well, that J makes sense. John <laughs> actually made primal therapy very popular with West Coast and hippies and the Rush Nishis. Mm. James Earl Jones became an advocate of it. And Tears for Fears was named after Primal Therapy. What? Yeah. That's crazy. John suddenly decided to leave the Institute, and Arthur Janoff would later say, we were just getting going. We had opened him up, and we didn't have enough time to put him back together again. Oh. I remember therapists talking like this in the 90s when I entered ther the therapeutic field. I remember there was a there was that sentiment was in was in the air in our profession of just like, you want to open people up, and but then you as the clinician have to put them back together again, which I do not hold that metaphor anymore. Lennon would later say, I still think that Janoff's therapy is great. I just don't know my, I just, I just know myself better. That's all. I can handle myself better. Yeah. That, that Janoff thing, the primal scream and so on, it does affect you because you recognize yourself in there. It was very good for me. So I, I had a couple of experiences that were certainly not intentional, uh, both of them under heavy alcohol, unfortunately. One of them was uh, I, I pulled off. I, I wasn't driving, luckily, but you know I, I, the person I was driving, I'm like, pull over. Pull. And, I, and I went up to a tree. This was in the middle of the night. Probably it was like, say, 2 a.m. in the morning. And I started just attacking the tree, breaking branches, just like going insane on the tree. I did this for I don't know how long and like, oh, so angry. And then, then I felt terrible and I started crying and apologizing to the tree for having killed it. And like, it was just like this crazy thing. 
and and I, I just like I felt like I had killed someone, you know, like it was uh, that was one experience. And then another one was I was coming home from a party and I was in the passenger seat and I was super drunk too. And all of a sudden, I started bawling uncontrollably. Well, were you, were you encouraging the expression or was it just coming out of you? It was just coming out of me. Right. So that's different. It's not, yeah. it's, primal therapy is drumming something up. That's fair. What, what I'm saying though is like the feeling of primal release, like baby level release. Yeah. It actually, in this weird way, felt therapeutic. Absolutely. If you have the emotion yeah. and it wants to come out, then yeah. let it come out yeah. for sure. That's, that's excellent. And it would not have come out, unfortunately, again, because I wasn't going through some sort of therapy. It wouldn't have come out naturally. It was right. like these extreme moments. That Well, and being drunk, your mechanisms of keeping that kind of stuff are compromised yeah. down. Um, yeah, so primal therapy certainly can be helpful to some people in that way. It can also be a massive bullshit experience because you take anybody and you do this to them. And right. you know, you take someone who's susceptible to the suggestion and you just say, okay, I want you to think about something horrible that happened. And actually, there's a new form of therapy that's kind of popular right now that is similar to this called lifespan integration therapy. And I know people want me to talk about this, and I will at some point. And lifespan integration therapy, it's, you know, from what I gather of it, it, it sounds like a legit form and sounds great. But it, the, in the way that it's taught, I think it has elements of this in that you take people, again, who are susceptible to this, and you say, I want you to think about something that's traumatic mm -hmm. in your life. Well, that naturally makes you uncomfortable, right? And it's going to bring up some emotions. You're going to feel angry. You're going to feel sad, especially if you really put people into that state. Right. Then you ask them, you ask the people to just, you know, express themselves, you know, in some, some way, some sort of free way. Well, what you end up doing is, you know, being potentially a little hysterical, meaning that you're... Uh, encouraging false emotions. You're just sort of like screaming, you know? And what that does to the body is it puts it through this, this uh, experience, uh, nervous system-wise, where eventually you're going to come down. And as yeah. you come down, you actually feel a sense of euphoria. It's similar to, remember that therapy that you did, that organ therapy where that, that, that guy like squeezed your head? Yeah. Remember that? Well, when you do that and then you release the right. squeezing of your head, you feel euphoric because you no longer have that pain in your head anymore. Right, right. Well, if at that time you have a charismatic leader who says, that is the magic of therapy, yeah. then as a susceptible person, you're just like, oh my God, oh, I want to wow. do this all the time. Right. But really all you're doing, so at, you know, like in that Rajneesh episode, what uh, John at, at Atak was talking about, what the Scientologists would do and what the Rajneeshis would do is if you hyperventilate yourself and you jump up and down, mm -hmm. uh, you actually you'll have too much oxygen in your blood. It's too acidic or something. And you'll end up uh, kind of being extremely uncomfortable, right? And then you uh, come down from that and you feel euphoric because your body is returning to a f state of homeostasis. Plus, your body releases all of this endorphins into your brain because it thinks it's under attack, yeah. you know? So you're screaming at the top of your lungs, ah, and your brain starts to try to calm you down. It's going like, ooh, we need endorphins. You know, he's freaking <laughs> out. You know what I mean? And we need, and then afterwards, you're in a state, you're high. Yeah. You're, you're high on your own juices, you know? Well, it's, I mean, so, you know, we've all probably experienced, uh, at a concert where you really get into it and they play that song you love and you just like singing and yeah. everything. And then afterwards you just get, or, oh, a, or another example, so you're at a concert and you're in the mosh pit or the slam yeah. dance pit. Right. And you, it's stressful, violent environment. Right. And then you walk away from that and you feel euphoric. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a false experience. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that, but it should be kept under pers in yeah. perspective having people go through primal therapy or what I might call sort of a simplistic bastardized lifespan integration therapy or other kinds of gestalt therapy, experiential therapies like these, everyone just has to understand that these effects are not likely to last. Yeah. And But if you're susceptible to suggestion, the charismatic leader like Fritz Perls or like Janoff here will say, 
that is you getting better. Right, right. They'll say, you are now getting better. That euphoric feeling, that is evidence that my therapy that you, can, you should continue to pay for is working. Right. When it might not be. I, I'm so lucky in a way when I found a therapist because it was the complete opposite of this kind of thing. Because the thing is, I can, as you know, I can role play along with something. And so, okay, we're going to get into this. Whoa. But I'm not, like, I don't fall for it, sort of. Like, so, like, back in high school, I would go to my friends had these revival churches, and they would, and it's the kind where everyone would get really into it. Some of them would start speaking in tongues. Someone would faint. So, you know, all these kinds of things, right? And I always just kind of like looked around and, you know, I'd clap along and sing, but I'm like, what the hell is wrong with these people, right? But the thing is, when I found my, my therapist, I've talked about this before, my initial instinct was to dramatize the whole thing, tell my life story and all these things. And, and, and she was much more about like, well, you know, let's talk about what's going on right now. How do you feel right now? What's going on? You know, like, and so it, it brought me back down to like, like a grounded, like what, a, what is going on in my life? What am I feeling? Instead of what I could have done, which is, oh, I have an audience. Let me play up. I'll scream at the top of my, I'll, you want to hear about my life? Yay. You right. know? Yeah. Now, this is not to say that emotional expression and experiential therapy is not helpful. It absolutely can. But the claims of the primal therapy movement were way overblown. Um, and guess what? John Lennon wasn't cured after this. You know what I mean? Um, but it did inspire him to do a lot of things. For example, the therapist perhaps suggested this, but he was like, okay, I'm going to confront my father. Mm. You know, my father's still alive. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confront him. And John invited uh, his father and his father's new family to his home. So imagine this. You're out. And I think John's living in the States at this point. So Alf and his... You know, one of the richest men in the world. Yeah. So Alf and his you know, new wife and his kids, they, they come to the States to meet John Lennon. And uh, John, a witness reported the following. John seized Freddie, his father Alf, by the lapels and shook him, screaming and howling at him. <gasps> John told his father if he went to the press with his life story, because I think... John was worried his dad was going to publish a life story about yeah. John himself. He would lock him in a crate and throw him out of a plane into the ocean to be drowned. Oh my God. And Alf, his father was legitimately afraid that John might actually go through with that. Yeah. You know, it, it, it was like, it didn't seem like a, a veiled. Well, and he's screaming. You don't know this person. It, yeah. He's, and he's your son, but you don't know them. Right. And John was, had a vibe of like, I'm serious, man. I'm unglued. Yeah. And, and so Freddie kept a very low profile after that. So, so again, th this is, this is potentially the outgrowth of this kind of primal scream therapy. It's like, Oh, I need to be radically honest and like attack people when I feel like I should attack them. Right. And John would later regret that. He also wrote mother out right. of this experience. Uh, being in primal therapy, screaming at the top of his lungs, yeah. inspired him to write one of his the best songs, one of the best songs he ever wrote. Yeah. So just you know, going through the lyrics here, they're heartbreaking. Uh, mother, you you mother, you had me, but I never had. But I you. never had you. Oh my god! I this is such a great line. <sighs> mother, you had me, like you gave yep. birth to me, but I never had you. I wanted you, but you didn't want me. Yeah. So I just got to tell you goodbye, goodbye. Father, you left me, but I never left you. I needed you, but you didn't need me. So I just got to tell you goodbye, goodbye. Children, don't do what I have done. So this is him saying, yeah. I'm also at fault here. Yeah. I couldn't walk and I tried to run. Yeah. So I just got to tell you goodbye, goodbye. Mama, don't go. Daddy, come home. And he says this over and over again. Mama. Mama. Mama yeah. And then, and then. It's like, Daddy, come home. I love that rhythm too because it's it, it's so offbeat, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's Mama, and then Daddy, come home. You yeah, know. Right. Oh my gosh. So I, I never knew the significance, but even though I didn't know all the story, I could tell it was real. It's like wow. Right. Like this is right. I know when deep, when you deep stuff when you know the real story of John Lennon, it's like this shit just gives me chills. Yeah. Because again he's such a tragic figure and I love his music so much, but this song is just so poignant. And yeah. I just, I love that kind of songwriting. And I, 
for I'm not I don't consider myself a lyricist very much, but I do try to write kind of like this where it's extremely overt in this way. Yeah. Um and obviously I'm not as good as John Lennon, but anyway, Ringo played on this track and this song has been covered by many people, including the roots. Actually, Google everyone out there, go on YouTube, watch the roots version of of Mother by I never Donald. knew that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a it's one of the best. That's it's, cool. I like the Roots, but it's the best Roots song I've ever heard. Yeah. Uh, Barbara Streisand sang it. Christina Aguilera and what? actually their versions are pretty. I good didn't too. know this was a covered song. Yeah. that's crazy. Okay, so now let's get to the seventies. Uh, he battles to stay in the United States. Nixon's trying to get him deported. Again, more transference with his father. Um, he was trying. They were trying to get away from Britain because the British people hated Yoko so much. Oh wow. A lot of activism against the war. Again, I think it's I think it was you know, obviously it was a good idea to be anti-Vietnam war, but I also think it was sort of transferential, you know, given his yeah. issues with authority. Um he and Yoko try to have many children. They have they they had or they tried to have children a lot at times. She had three miscarriages. So Wow. So another massive loss. Is that because of drugs, maybe? Well, she was older, right? Okay. So so she's like, I think oh, when, okay. when they had Sean, she was like in her 40s. Oh, okay, okay. Um, 1973, he and Yoko separate. Did you know this? No. Oh, yeah. They, they had massive relationship <laughs> problems. Um, he was physically abusive to her. Right. Uh, again, John with his borderline traits. He moved to Los Angeles, and uh, Yoko actually, so they had an assistant, May Pang, Okay. I think a Chinese woman, Chinese American woman. And uh, Yoko actually said to John, I want you to have an affair with Mei Peng. What? So, so again, more mother, yeah. right? So he, she basically set up this relationship to some extent. Okay. And so he goes to LA with her and he's seen around town with this new woman, Mei Peng. And guess what? He was physically abusive to her too. Oh. A friend of John's. So he, never, he never actually outgrew that. No. Well, maybe in the last couple of years of his <laughs> yeah. life. A friend of John's said, said uh, that John misunderstood something that Mei Peng said. And uh, John leapt at her and tried to strangle her. Wow. So this isn't just hitting. No, he's a almost murderer. <laughs> right. And the friend said that he had to physically restrain John wow. or... Who knows how far John would have taken it? Man, strangled this woman. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So again, when you have massive attachment disruption and injury and and abandonment and uh, damage, you can be easily triggered, you know, and you can become almost a different person. Nineteen seventy four goes back to Yoko, but a Yo- but Yoko allowed John to continue seeing Mei Peng as his mistress. Um, because Yoko was actually getting smothered by John, and yeah. I, she was like, "I can't do my art anymore because he wants me around all the time." And so, Sean is born <coughs> around this time, and some reports would say at this point he became much more dedicated as a father. Mm-hmm. And but there are other reports that his heroin addiction was actually getting worse, and he wasn't that great of a father. But anyway. Uh, at the very least, we do know that he left the music business entirely. And I actually forgot this, or I didn't notice it. Or, I didn't know that either. Yeah, if from 1975 until 1980, basically. Really? Yeah, he didn't do a single thing in music. He said in the interviews that his guitar was hanging on the wall above his bed, and he, hadn't, he for years, never even touched his guitar. That's crazy. Yeah. The last five years of his life. Yeah. But then he had Double Fantasy, which came out just before he died, actually, right? Um. Now, some people are, would say that he left the music business because of Sean, because he's like, I oh, want to dedicate myself to being a father. Um, I'm a feminist, so I'm going to stay but home. Could have been heroin. <laughs> but it also could have been heroin, yeah. right? Uh, John Lennon said that, quote, Sean was a planned child, and therein lies the difference from Julian. Yeah. I don't love Julian any less as a child. <sighs> He's still my son. Whenever he came, uh, whether he came from a bottle of whiskey or because they don't have, they didn't have pills in those days. He's here. He belongs to me. And oh my god! Well. What a horrible thing to say. Right. He's basically saying <sighs> Julian 
came from a bottle of whiskey and because they didn't have any pills back then. But, the, but don't worry about it. It doesn't make you any less of my son. Right. Can you imagine? the? La- that's a, surpr- a shocking lack of self- self-awareness, yeah. you know? Yeah. But honest, right? I mean, honest. But honest in a way that assumes like no one's listening. Yeah, maybe. Like, dude, people are listening, yeah, and maybe <laughs> including Julian. Right. 1976, uh, in his final years, his father wrote a manuscript about his life story. So Alf did write that manuscript. Okay. And he bequeathed it to his to John. So he, so he's like, I'm not going to publish it. But I, I. So this is Alf saying, I'm about Don't to throw me from an airplane. Well, what he's he's yeah. about to die. He's yeah. getting old, and he's just like, I want John to understand the real story. I see, I see. And you know that that it was like not all his fault that right. you know, and um, so Alf was dying of stomach cancer, and someone called John to let him know. And John was like, okay, fine. So he called his father on his deathbed. And John actually apologized to his father for his past behavior. Wow. And John said in, a, in an interview about his father, I came out of therapy and told him to get the hell out. And he did get the hell out. And I wish I hadn't really because everyone has their problems, including wayward fathers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm a bit older now, and I understand the pressure of having children or divorces and reasons why people can't cope with their responsibility. So, it, so he's getting older. Now he's in his you know later thirties, and he's like yeah. beginning to mature. You know, um, again during this time, he's still struggling with heroin, and Yoko was too, by the way. This is depicted in the movie Two of Us. Came out in the year two thousand. I like this movie, and Umberto isn't a good enough fan to so have watched it. But what Two of Us is more about Yoko and John. No, Two of Us is about John. John, not, John and Paul. I was just guessing because <laughs> you just said that this was depicted in that movie. No. Okay. The entire movie is Paul and John Damn hanging. It. T- it's like one evening of them hanging out and it's kind of a famous evening. Oh, but it's after the, the Beatles already broke up. Yeah. Which is why I don't want to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's a famous night because at one point they're hanging out in John's New York apartment Yeah. and they're, they're just laughing and goofing around and they're watching David Letterman. Oh. And, or The Tonight Show. Johnny Carson, probably. Johnny Carson. Yeah. One of them. And they were, they were this close to just, because it was right down the street where they felt, where they, well, no, Johnny Carson was in Burbank. Oh. So I think it was Letterman. Was he on that long ago? God, I, mean, I don't this think would have been, so. What seventy nine? No, that can't be. Well, but what? Anyways, they were watching something. Some, some <laughs> live, some yeah. live show, some live talk show, and they almost went there. And they almost drove down there and did a and did a performance, <gasps> an impromptu to performance. Oh my god! But John kind of got tired. He's like, ah, never mind. So imagine if that had happened, what, how that would have changed the narrative. Wow! Because right. it's like, wait, so they're still friends. And they're and they're hanging out, and they just sort of popped by and performed. And did a performance. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay, so skipping forward to 1980, age 40, uh, it's the Gosh. end of the year. He just a few weeks after Double Fantasy was released, he was at the beginning of a total comeback. Now, right? In a way, you could say it's it had been since 1967 since he had really really, really been a, a strong sure. songwriter. This album has "Woman," yeah, one of the best songs he ever wrote. Yeah, just like "Starting Over," oh great my God. song. "Beautiful Boy," oh my great God. song. "Watching the Wheels," uh, you know? nobody told me there'll be a D's like these. So good, so like awesome. Like right. the, he's he's come around right back into himself. And this is a album where every other song is a song by Yoko. So like you know. Four of the John, four of the five John songs are classics. Yeah. You know, it's like, because all those fucking albums that John would have, every other song was by Yoko. And yeah. it's like, so it limited the amount of John material yeah. that could be on these albums. But anyway. That's true. That's true. So that, if the album had just John songs, it's just hit after hit. After right. Hit. Yeah. Uh, December 8, 1980, Lita's birthday, by the way. Oh. Um, a man who will go unnamed because I don't want to no, glor- glorify. Terrible. Shot John a bunch of times in the back, killed him as he was coming home from recording, I think. And uh, the guy who killed him is still in prison. And from what I can tell, he was on the spectrum between bipolar and schizophrenia. He's very emotional and very angry at the world. And he was obsessed with the Beatles. He wanted to be a Beatle. Oh, my God. 
Then he was influenced by Christianity and hated. Le- so at first he loved John Lennon yeah. and loved the Beatles. And then he became a born again Christian of some kind. And then he was like, Ugh. wait, you know, John thought he was better than Jesus. Right, and he has right, the Imagine right. song. And so then he became very angry at John Lennon and his symptoms were getting worse. And he started planning on killing several celeb- celebrities. But wow. John had, because he was the working class hero. Yeah. He wanted, he hated fame, and so he yeah. wanted to just be a normal person in Manhattan. And he proud, he he prided himself on being able to walk around Manhattan without, without having to you know disguise himself yep. at all. He just wanted people to get used to him. <clears throat> so he was extremely accessible, and the guy who killed him knew that because he had oh, actually met man. John, you know, bef- before actually killing him. Um, <clears throat> so lots of people want to know, like, why would this guy kill John Lennon? And as with all these cases, you know, I get asked these questions a lot because I have a podcast and people ask me, you know, why did this happen? Why did that happen? I've studied it so much now, and the the best answer I can say is it's a complete mystery. There are so many people who fit this profile. Do you know how many schizophrenic people there are in the world? Do you know how many bipolar people there are in the world? Do you know how many angry Christians there are in the world? Right. There are so many, and uh, obsessive fans. There are yeah. so many. What makes the difference between right. those millions of people and that one person who decides to take that action? I can't tell you. All I can tell you is that yeah. he was untreated in his issues. And if we had more money for mental health dollars, uh, then maybe this might not have happened. I mean, he could have been a, a school shooter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, today, in all likelihood, yeah. that's what he would have been, or some kind of other yeah. mass killer. Um, do you remember when this happened, when John Lennon died? Uh, I, I loosely, I mean, I was five. Yeah. So I loosely remember it being a big thing. I absolutely know? remember it. I was, I was, I just turned 10 years old, and John Lennon's songs were, because the Double Fantasy album was a big smash i think mother might have been the first hit i'm not quite sure but probably not actually anyway the point is is that by the age of 10 again in my world the beatles was a big thing and even post beatles you know john paul george ringo songs and to have a you know a pop star die it was such a big deal i i also remember when elvis died just because elvis had died just a few years before that but I really remember when John died, and I even remember where I was when I found out. I was in the car driving, you know, passenger seat. My mom's driving, and I think we were going to the mall. And it was actually probably for Christmas shopping because mm-hmm. this is December 8th, right? And I remember uh, hearing about it on the radio, and, you know, my mom was just like, because my parents weren't big Beatles fans, but they certainly would right. be shocked by such a thing. And I remember, I think all day, every radio station, all they played was John Lennon songs. Of course. And so it was this big kind of event. Which is sort of what I remember, because I didn't really have the context of who are the Beatles or anything. Like, but I remember, oh, this mus- this famous musician died. And I remember hearing Imagine on the radio, like, right, like related to him being killed or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was the first time I remember, like, other than ABBA, and uh, the Carpenters. I hadn't yet had other music that left such an impact. When I heard Imagine, I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know? Wow. Okay. So that brings us to the end of his his life. Again, let's look at all of his abandonments and losses. Abandoned by dad, left at home alone by mom multiple times. Mom abandoned him and had another family. Uh, early in life, he's he's left. He's put with his uncle because his mom was in a maternity home. Dad moves away, has another family. His dad, his uncle dies. His mom dies tragically. His best friend dies tragically. He finds out he has a sister, can't find her. His father figure Brian dies tragically. He loses his best friend Paul. At times, he actually loses Yoko too. So all this abandonment and pain. And he's just in a constant state of of that borderline pain. Uh, so let me review, you know, the overall conceptualization here. Again, I can't diagnose from afar. God knows what his the reality of his personality was. But my before doing this deep dive, I would have said, 
well, I don't know. John probably didn't have any disorder. I can't really think of anything that he would have had. Um, you know, he's just a songwriter, nice guy. Yeah, he had some rough edges, but, you know, what's the big deal? Who doesn't? But looking deeper at the darker side of John Lennon's life that he admitted to, yeah. you know, it, and I didn't go over this, but in later interviews, you know, in the late 70s, he would he would talk openly about the fact that he would beat yeah. Cynthia and he was a terrible father to Julian and he was, um, you know, it was, it was rough. Um, so... I would conceptualize him as being a mild borderline, sort of a mild to moderate borderline with a dash of narcissism. Yeah. Um, not the super destructive type like Charles Manson or something, but yeah. the normal type, the, ty- the type I see in my therapy office. And here, is my, here are my seven points of, of evidence. Number one, from the, age of, from the age of five, he saw himself as a genius. So this is part of his narcissism. When he was young, he saw him. He had this sort of grandiose, uh, mm-hmm. a, a defensive grandiosity. Mm-hmm. When the Beatles started out, before they had any kind of fame or fortune, he was like, "Where are we going, boys? To the toppermost of the poppermost, Johnny." Right. So he, you know, similar to you and me. Yeah. You need a dash of narcissism to get you up in the morning. Right. To to even try to achieve some kind of fame. Right. And and he so that's why he was just a, a you know an asterisk narcissist right because he certainly didn't present the classic signs of narcissistic personality throughout his life it was much more characterized as borderline number two like you'd have to say something like like you know people like me who have a very superior intellect don't believe conclusions from all the scientists in the world <laughs> and he would never have let Paul get any of the limelight right you know what I mean. And Paul got equal amount of yeah, limelight as John did. Totally. Um, number two, John was paranoid about women leaving him and cheating on him. This is a classic borderline and narcissistic thing. Run for your life, jealous guy. Like extremely. Yeah. Uh, beat his partners, um, and he had to use substances to escape his his paranoia. And not paranoia in the sense of schizophrenia, but para- paranoia in the sense of uh, borderline paranoia. W- was Anna a cover or was that his? That's a cover. It is a cover. Okay, because it's funny. It's like that's such an early song about. But he must have chosen it on purpose, right? Like it's not a violent song. It's the opposite. It's like what he probably wanted to be like, right? Uh, written and directed by Arthur Alexander. Um, number three, he changed his look very often. You know, of all the Beatles, he has the most dis- disparate looks throughout the years. Uh, Early yeah. John, uh, yeah. 67 John, 70 John, 75 John, 80 John, right. <laughs> like very different. And again, potentially a lack of self, or maybe he's just really into fashion. I don't know. That was sort of a weak one. Number seven, he joked around a lot from childhood to mask his pain. He was the most jokey of all yeah. the Beatles in sometimes inappropriate times. Right. And that, you know, it's to manage his anxiety about... The rest of you, the, the rest of you just frat tell your jewelry. Right. So obviously it was a pro. <laughs> I mean, he did that to like the royal audience, yeah, you yeah. know? Or to the queen, wasn't the to queen? To the queen, yeah. yeah. Number five, he reenacted his traumas. He abandoned Cynthia. He abandoned Julian. Uh, he abandoned Paul you know, just dropped them, you know, just like, I'm done with you, yeah. you know, forget, forget my wife, forget my son. I'm o- it's over. He made people feel abandoned. Um, number six, he had all good, all bad relationships with his mom, Stuart, Paul, Yoko, um, and other people. And number seven, this is really the clincher for me, because it's one thing to have all good, all bad relationships, but throughout his life, he had evidence and he reported he had ongoing psychic pain and he wrote music about this. Yeah. He was clearly struggling with the classic borderline and narcissistic pain that they feel. They People with this uh, trauma injury, it's not just like, you know, occasionally being triggered. It's like, to what degree are they being triggered on a minute by yeah. minute basis? When they're severely triggered, that's when you'll see them reacting quite badly. But if you just ask them at any moment how they feel about themselves, they'll they'll say, "I feel like shit." Yeah. 
In fact, a lot of people with borderline will say they feel empty on the inside, they feel worthless or you know lacking worth of any sort. Um, that's why they resort to cutting a lot of the time. They'll be sort of chronically suicidal because they're in a constant state of psychic pain. They just feel terrible. Uh, and he was searching for answers in alcohol, in music, in Paul, in Yoko, in Stewart, in LSD, in pot. Heroin was a big one, which actually probably did work to some extent, but has its downside, obviously. He slept a lot. He tried to meditate. He did primal scream therapy. He did all these kinds of things. And, you know, it didn't really work. Maybe it got him through the years. The tragedy, as you said, it's like, where would John have been in his 40s? Right. He was at, he had just released his best solo album of all time. Yeah. And for, like, Mother is a great song, but I'm not going to pop in that song right. just to listen. You know, it's a song you sit down and yeah. sort of like endure with him. Yeah, yeah. But like, like Woman, that's yeah. a song you just put on yeah. any circumstance. Great tune. Um, and so, where would, what music would have John done Created, yeah. in the 80s? Uh, where would he have gone maturity wise? Like, yeah. on the trajectory he was on, he was on a trajectory to be the most mature, most self-aware Beatle of of all four. Of yeah, them. it took because it took Paul till this last tour. I finally saw him like round a corner of like, oh, it's not just about me, you know. <laughs> and, and, and so you're right. Like John would have done some amazing work in the '80s. Right. So it it's interesting to think about. You know, or he could have, you know, gone down further, you know, who knows what would have really happened, but, but it's a tragedy and his life was tough and I can't believe I've been a massive Beatles fan for this long and I haven't really ever understood John Lennon. Yeah. What have you learned today, bro? Well, so you like to think of people like John Lennon in a, wow, what a charmed life. Imagine being John Lennon. Like, you're just like king of the world. You have all these hits. You're like the massive rock star. All these trips around the world. Adoring fans screaming so loud you can barely play your music. But then you listen to this and you're like, wow. That guy lived in pain from the moment he was born till the moment he died. And a pain that is hard to relate to to some extent. And, and, and granted, it influenced his music. But it also, like, it pulled him down way more than it brought him up. And and so when you look at that, you're like, yeah, that that's not something you would easily want to trade for. That that it, that amount of pain, of constant anguish, of constant self loathing, of um, so it's it's hard. And so it, it it also grows your empathy for not only him but folks that might be suffering like that. And it also brings a new light on wow, you know, we idolize him, but he was he was really abusive, and he was really he had things that we would demonize, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's hard to reconcile. I mean, on some level, there were times when I was doing this deep dive when I was like, so do I have to hate John Lennon now? Yeah. In the end, I think I just understand him better. And Yoko has continued to speak well of John. It's yeah. not like when he died, she's like, oh, good riddance to that asshole. Yep. So he must have had redeeming qualities, you know. Yeah. So you it's know. like there's got to be some line between. On the one extreme, you have Hitler, like I just I can't like anything about the guy, right? And on the other extreme, you have someone that's never done anything wrong, and so you have nothing. But there's a lot of grays in the middle, yeah. And I think John's got to land on the gray zone. Well, and to me, which is actually the way I see the vast majority of DV perpetrators and drug addicts for that matter, is they are only doing that because of the deep suffering that they're going through. Mm -hmm. DV perpetrators, on the whole, don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to control the shit out of my spouse. Right, 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 right. And I'm going to beat them and intimidate them. They wake up in the morning and they're just like, I hope someone loves me. Yeah. And then they get triggered and they freak out. Yeah. And, you know... So I thought we'd end with me s- listing my favorite John Lennon songs of all time and you singing a line from each one. Okay. Please please me. Um, please please me, oh yeah, like I please you. Do you want to know a secret? 
Listen to how do you want to know a secret? There's a place. There is a place. A uh, hard day's night. It's been a hard day's night. I should have known better. I should have known better with a girl like you. That's a great one, right? Yeah, it's so good. If I fell. If I fell in love with you, would you promise to be true and help me understand? And oh, so I've been in love. I'll do the part. I'll do the part. And I found that love was more than just holding hands. If I give my heart to you, I must be sure from the very start. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. That, we yeah, prob- we probably need that. an accompaniment. But anyway. Well, because I always sing the Paul part. So I don't oh, you really, do? Yeah. I thought we've sang that before and you sang oh, the I John might have, part. but I always sing the Paul part. <laughs> uh, I don't want to spoil the party. Um. I don't want to spoil the party, so I'll go. So I'll go. Help. Help. I need somebody. Help. You've got to hide your love away. Uh, Hey, you got to hide your love away. You're going to lose that girl. You're going to lose that. Yes, you're going to lose that. You're going to lose that girl. Ticket to ride. By the way, that's another, that lose, lose your, that girl is another. Kind of. Yeah. Um, Ticket to ride. Um, I think I'm going to be sad. I think it's today. Yeah. Norwegian Wood. Uh, oh, one of my favorites. Um, yeah, this is the one, one of the ones that we sang. Yeah. Because it's on. Um, isn't it good? Norwegian Wood. Oh. Nowhere Man. He's a real nowhere man. Girl. Girl, ah, girl. Yeah. Uh, I'm only sleeping. I'm only sleeping. <laughs> she said. She said. Didn't. Didn't. Did um. Uh, how does that one go? She, she said. She said. I know what it's like to be dead. Day tripper. Uh, day tripper. Yeah. A hard day's night. Did is, no, we already did that one. Oh, uh, where did yeah? Where did did you help? Oh, I think I double counted. Help. Um. I am the walrus. I am the Eggman. I am the Eggman. <laughs> I am the walrus. You are the Eggman. Cuckoo, good you. Strawberry fields. But but no, I am the Eggman because you know the walrus was Paul. But I think he says I am the no, Eggman. No, in the song he does. But later he later later it comes out that the walrus was Paul. Yeah. So I'm fixing the lyrics for him. Oh, I get it. <laughs> uh, strawberry fields. Uh, there are places, <laughs> um, strawberry fields forever. Sexy Sadie. Uh, sexy Sadie, you broke the rules. Come together. Come together right now. I always thought that song was about an orgy. Over me. <laughs> you know what it's about? The war, isn't it? Like, Well, on Wikipedia, I, which God knows... It said that it's about he was writing this song because Timothy Leary was gonna run against Ronald Reagan for California governor in nineteen seventy. Come all flat top, and that's the he come all groovy. Like Maybe that. yeah, and oh. so come together is like a campaign song for Timothy Leary. Come together, meaning like oh. come on, everyone, let's come together. Oh, and interesting. I, I, I could be wrong about that, but that really changes the whole. Yeah, that changes plus a lot. Timothy Leary for for governor. And then Timothy Leary got arrested on pot possession and went to prison so he couldn't run for, <laughs> for governor anymore. Across the universe. Woods are flowing out like endless love. into <laughs> a paper cup. Yeah, so those are uh, just some of my favorite uh, letters. You didn't songs. have In My Life, though. Yeah, I like that song, but okay. it, again, it's not, it's not one that I would put in my top you know, okay. 30 or so. What about LSD? Uh, that's a good song. Make sure yourself in the boat but again, down the river. I'm not going to pop that one in. Like, Tangerine tree. You know, I, uh, do you want to know a secret? There's a place. Yeah, those are no. Those are oh, so I forgot. Good. No reply. Um, we said our goodbyes. No, wait, how does no reply go? Uh, God. Well, let's. No move. reply. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, that's it. Um, <laughs> I, I just. 
Yeah, it, essentially. <laughs> I'm a, it starts? I'm a loser. Uh, I'm a loser, and I'm not how I, I appear, appear to be. So again, another song that kind of reveals his, his inner working. Did we do eight days a week? Oh, that was not in your... Uh, apparently, according to the internet, McCartney mainly wrote that song. Oh, did he? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Lennon had a piece yeah. of it, but... Uh, yeah, they this website the Beatles Bible yeah. whatever it was like mainly McCartney eight, eight days a week um yeah so let us know what you think um again if you're one of the pedantic folks uh you know if we got a couple things wrong I don't want to hear about it if we got a massive thing wrong uh, let me know because I'm always interested in learning but also let me know what you think about this sort of thing. Um, I'm guessing you must be a John Lennon fan at some level to be listening to this. And I'm, I'm guessing if you're anything like me, it's like, Ooh, this is new information. You know, this is, I, I didn't know this stuff. This is, this is interesting. Tell us how your reaction is to it. That it does it for that episode. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. It's like Bob Dylan meets something else. <laughs>